They were golfing. Who golfs? Glenn and KK. He's, He's avenged. avenged. No, yeah, I was gonna say. I did, I hated it for many, many, many years. Oh, that hurts. What? Yeah. I'm surprised. I didn't really want to do this video. It's too much work, but I listed better by you and they said, do it. So I was like, fuck, I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm, I'm in, I'm all in. And then you killed yourself. <laughs> Welcome back to our channel. We, we've been away for a while and, um, you know, things get busy. Uh, but here we are today to review Judas Priest and we thought that it might be time to do this video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, if you're wondering what the goal is here, we're going to review every Judas Priest album chronologically. We're going to rate them and we're going to rank them. First though, we're going to discuss a little bit about what our background is with uh, Judas Priest. <laughs> Introduced to Priest in the mid 80s uh, by my cousin who was like six months older than me. And uh, the first album I heard and then bought was Ram It Down. Uh, so we'll, oh, that was your first album, Ram yeah, It Down. Yeah, so that was in 1988. So we'll talk about Ram It Down. Around the same time, I was into like Def Leppard and Guns N' Roses and yeah. Poison. And so Priest was a step towards a much heavier direction for me. Yeah, more metal. Yeah. And then. Uh, Painkiller was really the album that solidified because that came out two years later. It was basically the soundtrack to the start of my high school year. And, um, you know, from that point forward, I was a Priest fan, but I also looked backward in the rearview mirror at, well, where did they come from? Mm -hmm. And so I went and picked up all their older discography, and that took a few years to do that. But of course, over the high school years, you know, that was the early 90s, and that's when metal started to fade. Um, and then, you know, over the years, I've had the chance to see uh, Judas Priest live three times with three different lineups. So we'll talk about lineups as we go through each album. Um, oh, yeah, the lineups are confusing if you're not like a big priest. Yeah, fan. exactly. Like the drummers at the beginning, like who, like <laughs> what? It's a revolving door. Yeah. yeah, the drummer. Anyways, yeah, so we'll talk about uh, the lineups, of course. But yeah, so I've seen Priest live three times. They were incredible all three times. Probably the second time was my favorite in Halifax, six, seven years ago. They're my favorite band. They yeah. are your favorite band. Yes. It's not Maiden. Correct. It's Judas Priest. Absolutely. Even though, like in the last video, I said Iron Maiden was the quintessential metal band. Yeah. This is where it will be kind of a polarity here, a difference, because True. that is his, this is his favorite band. He listed them in high school, all this and that. That wasn't me. Like, I liked Iron Maiden in high school. I liked Carcass a lot. I liked Anthrax, Slayer, Megadeth, you know, early on. Judas Priest, I had the, the best of Judas Priest, which is ironic because that came out in 1978. <laughs> so it's basically half a rock roll half a Sad Wings. That's exactly what it is. And sadly, the Sad Wings part is side B. And if you can <laughs> fucking tolerate side A, well... Then you can listen to side B, but I would usually listen to the first track on it, which I forget what it is. And I'd be like, holy, I can't stand this. <laughs> but Judas Priest wasn't the biggest band in my school. Metal was kind of not existent where I, when I went to high school. Um, I did have Painkiller, though. I, I forget when I bought it, but I did buy Painkiller in the 90s. I also, um, so I have, you know, a good exposure to that album, which was amazing. I liked it a lot. Um, then... If somewhere in the late 90s, I started picking up the older catalog. So I bought like Sad Wings and um, Sin After Sin. Um, and then kind of like I've been branching out since then. And then for this video, well, um, I went through all my Priest albums and re-listened to and listened to some new ones that I knew, honestly had not spent, spun before. So that's my background. Not the expert on Priest. This is the guy. Uh, and we're going to talk about Priest now, I think. Yeah. Okay, so first a little bit about Judas Priest. Um, they are a British or English heavy metal band from Birmingham, England. And uh, they've been around for a long fucking time. Uh, you know, I mentioned that I went to see them live. Uh, the last tour I saw was, it was the 50th anniversary tour. Yeah, they formed in 69. Yeah, it's crazy. As Judas Priest, disbanded after six months. And then, what's his name, joined another band called Freight, which had KK was in Freight. Yeah. And then Freight, took over the priest moniker, <laughs> which is weird. So what came first? Yeah, uh, you're going into details in the book that I just don't remember. Yeah. But yeah. But anyway, 69. So 69, and then their first album came out in 73 or two. And none of those 69 members have, are in the band. Cor correct, yeah, exactly. 
Original singer was Al Atkins. Nobody knows who that is anymore. Yeah. It's, but Freight had, I believe, KK, I think. So he would be one of the, you could say, a founding member still. Yeah. Or not even still. <laughs> but uh, So the first recorded album of Judas Priest had the seminal, like, Rob Halford, Glenn Tipton, KK Downing, bass guitarist Ian Hill, and then the drummer, uh, uh, John Hinch was the drummer on that first album. And yeah, so they've just been around for a long, long time. And Tipton joined late, I think, for Rockarola. Like, I don't think he wrote anything on Rockarola. You're, I think you're right. Um, and for then, much. He maybe wrote one or two, uh, but their old singer, Al Atkins, has writing credits on that album. Probably, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and I think the rest is a KK, probably, and Rob. Okay. Um, yeah, so we'll, anything else you want to add about their history? No, that sounds like a good summary. Yeah. First up, Rockarola. Rockarola woman for a Rockarola man. You can take her if you want to, you can. Okay. It's kind of sh sh shitty, <laughs> <laughs> um, but not totally shitty. Yeah. I like Rockarola and Run of the Mill. Oh, what do we rate it? Rate it, yeah. So our rating for this. So we rate out of 10. Out of 10. And I give Rockarola an 8.5 out of 10. Jesus, it's a 5. <laughs> it's a 5 for It's you. no more than a 5, this album, sadly. Because <laughs> it, it has really cool beginnings, but about that's about it. I think if the band were reflecting on this album, they'd probably feel more like you. Like it was the beginning. They were still trying to find themselves. Their fashion was something totally different back then. And uh, there's actually two covers. I got to show the other cover. The oh, this. Oh, yeah. Which one was on that one? Yeah, that's, the original is the pop. That's pop the original one. one. That's I'll a show cool here. cover. Whatever. It's like a Coca-Cola riff, but uh, yeah. and it was originally designed for a Rolling Stones album. Oh, was it? Uh, and then this, what? Did they, they just change it. They change yeah. it to Rock and Roll. And this Judas Priest logo here is uh, the only time you see it. Mm. Is on Interesting. This Good point. Um, but yeah, so the, the cover you see here was on later reissues. It's the Flying Robot Man or whatever. Yeah, so this album it is disjointed. It, it's we mentioned um, before, but uh, Rockarola was written by mostly KK. Uh, their old singer, Al Atkins, had some writing credits. There are actually two that were co written by what I'm calling the trio, is uh, with you know Rob, Glenn, and KK. The three of them wrote most of Judas. The Beast. big three. The big three. So those three wrote Rockarola, the title track, and Run of the Mill, uh, which is, to me, the, the best song on the album. Run of the Mill is good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's so good. Yeah, that's a good song. Um, no issue there. Yeah, so Run of the... Okay, we'll talk about Run of the Mill. Like, that bass line throughout the entire song is incredible. Halford's vocals are there. The vocals are there. You hear him screaming and you're like, whoa, okay, what? I wonder what it would feel like to hear that the first time when it come out. I would be like, what? This is amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. in 1973, like, that was totally knocking people's socks off. Must have been, but nobody, nobody but no, cared. Nobody cared. Like, <laughs> it sold, like, thousands of copies, not, yeah. not hundreds of thousands. I guess overall, I give it an 8.5. I love the music on it. I've grown into it. You know, it is when you start with Ram It Down and Painkiller and then go back to Rockarola. No. It's totally different. No, they're two different bands. Yeah, yeah but um, I still liked what was going on. It's very bluesy. Um, it's very, you could see that the foundation was there for what they would become. Uh, you could see, especially in Run of the Mill, the dual guitars. Like, it's just, it's, it's a beautiful song on a beautiful record. It could have even been better. Um, I think the producer, Bain, I think his name was Brain or Brian or whatever, something like that. Uh, he, um, Tipton had joined and he had wrote uh, songs already, had Tyrant and Ripper. And Bane oh. was like, no, no, that, that's a, <laughs> those aren't good songs. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he, Epitaph too he had as okay. well written. Yes. So this could have been a, a, an even better album. Um, uh, those producers, and I feel like we're going to, this will be an echo, a theme throughout uh, Judas Priest's career is I think they've had some shitty producers. <laughs> yeah, they have. <laughs> and um, some good ones, but... Some, yeah, and yeah. some good ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so for me, this is a five. It's okay. Good uh, good debut, uh, but kind of dull. Kind of kind of boring. Uh, <laughs> I don't find it boring. But Rockarola is good. Yeah. And, and like you said, Run the Mill. Uh, I love that song. Those are actually the two tracks that I'd highlighted that yeah. I liked. One for the Road, too. Like the, you know, that's on there. It's, that's a great song. The opener. It's like four minutes, but it's a well, rocking song. Well... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, it, there's fans for everything. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the record. It'll, you'll see where it'll place in my top eighteen later. But um, okay, it's it's not the worst Priest album, at least by any stretch for me. And oh yeah, I, was, I mentioned earlier the the drummer was John Hinch. 
only album he appears on, and uh, I don't know anything about him other than he was the drummer on this album. Okay. Oh, one other thing about uh, Rockarola is it's the only album where Rob Halford was credited as Bob Halford. Bob. Who's Bob Halford? And Glenn Tipton with one N. One N, <laughs> one N Glenn. What's, it was just misspelled or? Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess. It's still Glenn. Yeah. All right, we're gonna talk about Sad Wings of Destiny. Neither one of us owns on, this on CD, but right. I do have it on vinyl. I have it on CD, but it's a weird CD, and I'll, oh, yeah, I'll mention like, it. I'll mention okay. it later. So that's that's Sad Wings of Destiny, iconic album cover. Right, which they commissioned a, some artists to do it, who actually did quite a few cool album covers, Stradivarius being one of them. Oh, I did not know that. Um, but this is, for me, one of my, probably my favorite Priest album cover, which is weird because I find they have other really good ones, but this style is really unique to this album. Yeah. I yeah. like it. And you see that the, the angel there has got the Judas Priest cross logo. It's, you know, you can't see it, but it's there. And Glenn with two N's on the back. Do you know anything about Judas Priest cross logo? I don't. No, other than, I don't know who created it. Maybe it was this artist, but it's become iconic. They use it in lots of merch, different albums. Yeah. It's on the back of a lot of album covers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder. Okay, well, we're going to get comments on that. Yep. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, so Sad Wings, uh, f what do you rate it? Perfect 10 for me. 10! Hey, you too? Yeah, man. Alright, awesome. <laughs> Sad Wings is a 10. Wow. Did it sell? No. Did people care? <laughs> Not so much. Is it amazing? Yes. Tyrant and uh, victim Ripper, of Victim of Change, Jimmy Deceiver. So... Genocide. Yeah, I mean... So Black Sabbath kind of were the proto metal, like created the genre, but uh, Priest took it one step further and really put the nail in the coffin of heavy metal. No, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> Priest really took it one step further and really hammered it home. Uh, and they created almost like a new, like I hear elements of a lot of 80s thrash in Priest, in 70s Priest. And I, you even hear the beginnings here, maybe with Ripper, a lot of like down picking and uh, maybe not quite as fast, maybe not quite as For dirty. Sure. But, but fast still and mean, angry. And actually, Sad Wings has a lot of gothic elements too. It's like uh, dark. It's, it's kind of like the, the lyrics are cool, which is, which I, I won't be able to say that for the future <laughs> Priest albums. Um, but the lyrics were really cool. Um, and uh, it's just really uh, cool fucking album. I just love it. Yeah. It's mean. It's very mean. Uh, like it starts off with Victim of Changes and immediately, like when you compare it to Rockarola, it's like totally, it's like two different bands, like you said earlier. It's, it's just Victim of Changes just grabs you by the balls and then holds you. And it's like, it's an amazing song, first of all. It's like, top, you know, top 10 pre songs of all time. Um, and then after that song starts The Ripper. And which is also like that guitar, dee -dee 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 -dee, like <laughs> just incredible start. And, and then the whole album is just good consistently the whole way through. Um, yeah, I love this record from Victim of Changes to Island of Domination. It's a complete record. Yeah, it's complete. It's a, it sets the blueprint for heavy metal from the, the look of the album, the sound of the music, the twin guitars, the solos, uh, the drumming. And uh, yeah, so we're both gushing over this top, you know. It's I a, know. It's like, ten. I feel like we should talk longer about it, but I don't feel like we need to. If you want to pull out, or is it still there? My Priest album, the yeah, first one? Yeah. So I did have this on CD. So they were on Gull Records at the time, and they had a breakup with them. And actually, to this day, Priest doesn't own the rights to their first two albums. So you'll see these weird releases, which I, I bought probably years, fucking years ago, like 20 years ago or something, but, and, which has the two first that's albums. That's funny, it has the two, because like they're totally different. They're, yeah. they're so different. Yeah. So this is like a double, double album and stupid me. I just, I don't know. I'm like, okay, I'm good, but I should go buy a, just the single album. Do you remember around what time you first heard Sad Wings? Sometime in the nineties. Okay. I probably didn't like it at first. Yeah, that's um, what I'm curious about. But what it is, is those songs, they wrap themselves around you uh, in a weird way. Like it's they're, it's like a grower. I don't know. I feel like a lot of young metalheads probably disregard it quickly. They want to go for Screaming for Vengeance or something. Mm -hmm. But like, it's not, no, this is really where the gold is, I think. Yeah. Um, hmm, it's weird because priests changed a lot. Like they're not, this isn't the priest that people know uh, anymore. Uh, true, very true. So... 
Okay, moving on to 1977. Seven? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Se Sad Wings was 76. 76. And then Sin After Sin. Sin After Sin. 1977. 1977, which you give a... 10 out of 10. 10. For me, yeah. 10 for me as well. Oh, okay. Two tens. Yeah. Nice. Really the... F yeah. I mean, this kind of like follows along with the, the with Sad Wings. It goes... They go well together, they this do. album. Kind of the same, but the songs are even a bit meaner, like, or uh, right? Yeah, it's yeah. a bit more aggressive, um, except Diamonds and Rust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially Sinner, the opening track, like it just yes. starts off really well. That's a seven minute track. Um, it feels cutting edge. It feels tight. It feels like meaningful. It feels like if you were to listen to this in the 70s, you'd be like, holy hell, <laughs> what did I stumble across? Yeah. While everybody else is listening to the Eagles. You know what I mean? <laughs> true. Like, what is this metallic beast? Yeah. Yeah, it, except for, like, Diamonds and Rust does have a gallop, though. Dun, 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 yeah. dun, 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 dun. So, which Maiden, you know, uh, is known for. I love that, that cover by Joan Baez. Like, it's a great cover song. It was yeah. The first time they do a cover song, and the first of, like, three or four times, I, just, I think something that the record label asked them to do to help sell more records. So they covered Joan Baez on this album. Um, I forgot to mention on Sad Wings that the drummer uh, was uh, Alan Moore, and that was the only record he appeared on. On Sin After Sin, they hired a guy, Simon Phillips. Uh, he was just a session drummer in the credits. They don't even list a drummer as being a band member. They just say, you know, hey, special thanks to Simon Phillips for uh, the drum performance or whatever. Uh, he's a session drummer who's played for all kinds of bands like Gary Moore, Tears for Fears, um, he even played on an obscure uh, metal band, Galaxy, from, I think they're from Sweden, on an album that came out in 2021. So he's still doing session drums for people. I love that you're covering all the drummers because I, I cannot do that. <laughs> and this, obviously, um, he's a session drummer. He only appears on this album. Uh, Les Binks joins the band after this album and records with them for the next three albums. Um, yeah, so, like, uh, um, I don't know what else to add from what you said. Well, Starbreaker... Starbreaker. Dissonant Aggressor, which I heard from Slayer first, okay, honestly. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, oh, this song's awesome. And then you're like, oh, dude, you don't realize. <laughs> um, and then uh, Here Come the Tears, kind of brooding, but heavy, like yeah. heavy. Yep. Yeah, and okay. heavy. Um, Raw Deal, Halford admits, was his coming out song. Oh, okay. That I didn't know. But he did not know either, I don't think. The way he says it, it's like he didn't know when he wrote it okay. that he was coming out. Okay. But they have a reference in that song, a specific reference to a part of New York. It's an island, uh, under a Long Island, and it's like some gay island or something. I don't know what. It's a place <laughs> where gays go and they can be friendly. Okay. Um, and it's referenced in that song. Oh, no way. So I, I guess Raw, Raw Deal is, is uh, Halford mentions is, is that. So okay. even f as far back as that. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, but it's an amazing album. Like I say, it's really just... Uh, just some pure, solid, like 100% metal. Feels even, so good. Even like Last Rose of Summer, it's a ballad, but yeah. like Halford carries that song so well. And, um, you know, ballads became an integral part of metal, especially in the 80s. Um, and so, you know, Priest was right there at the beginning starting it. So, Okay, so off to, by the way, this was, this was a, they uh, signed with Columbia for this album. Oh, right. So yes. they weren't with Gull anymore. And they stayed with Columbia for quite a while. Yeah, and we didn't talk about the album cover all that much. I think it's cool, but it's it's a little weird. Like, it looks like it was pieced together yeah. with different things. It's cool. I, I, I get what they were going for. Yeah, um, it's not, for some reason, it's an album cover. We don't, I don't care. I don't, I don't hate it or like yeah. it. It's just like, okay, it's a building. <laughs> like a court or something? I don't know. There's a weird, like, outline of a lady. Um, it's also the last appearance of the Judas Priest logo here that we saw yes. first on, uh, on Sad Wings. Yeah, this one. Yeah. So then we go to Stained Class, which is the introduction of the squiggly Judas Priest logo. This is the first album where Judas Priest, on their album cover, they do this thing. They, they've done many album covers where they have something diagonal from the upper left corner down to the lower right corner. Oh, okay. Even Firepower has that yeah. from the upper left corner to the lower right corner. Okay, yeah, I didn't really catch that. Okay, you're talking about this thing. Song, yeah, that's yeah. the first album where they do that. Okay. And I don't know, are they doing that on purpose? And I love, I love consistency. I love it. I love finding patterns. And uh, so anyway, I, that's something I noticed. Yeah, that's cool. And what do you rate this? 
Stay in class is a perfect 10 out of 10 for me. 10 for me too. <laughs> so we have the Holy Trinity. Yeah. The first three albums Absolutely. is the Holy Trinity priests. Um, right? Exciter? Holy uh -huh. shit. That's a blueprint for thrash metal right there. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, and there's actually a thrash metal, Canadian thrash metal band called Exciter. Exciter. And I'm like, they must have... They must uh, have named their band they, after this. They song. absolutely did. But yeah. Not that they own the word or anything, but... Yeah. Uh, what else? White Heat, Red Hot. Better By You. The Spooky Tooth cover. Yes. Yeah. That wasn't even supposed to be on the album. <laughs> the producer wanted something a bit more commercial on there. So they snuck that one in. And that was a theme for later albums as well. And that gave them trouble, that song. It did, yeah, in the 80s. Are you going to talk about that later? Or well, not? it's on this album, so... Yeah, okay. Yeah, so in the mid-80s or whatever it was, they um, uh, some couple of kids commit suicide. One f succeeded, one did not. And the family sued the band, and there was, like, massive litigation. It was just not a great scenario. Priest later wrote songs about it, and... Um, they couldn't go... Uh, there was one of the amendments. We're not American. And that's free speech. There was no case with the lyrics because of free speech. But they could go on the angle of subliminal... Subliminal, uh, subliminal messaging? Like sure, the yeah. The backmasking of lyrics? Right. Yeah. So they could tackle... So they, there was a thing where they said that Rob Halford says, do it. Yeah. <laughs> Which does he even? I don't know. I never I noticed. Know. I never yeah. noticed him saying, do it. Yeah. Anyway, do what, man? <laughs> go ride a bike? Like... It doesn't say go shoot yourself. <laughs> that was so stupid. That really? trial was stupid and it got thrown out. Um, there's a f famous comedian who actually ridicules the trial. I forget his name. Oh, okay. Because it was a really dumb trial. It was. I mean, the 80s were characterized by the satanic panic and yeah. the Christian right was kind of all over the place. And, you know, we're seems like we're back there today. But, um, yeah, there was... There was, no, there was nothing there. Even like all the bands that they were after, like Motley Crue would shout at the devil and Twisted Sister, like you're barking up the wrong tree. Meanwhile, there were bands back then doing really satanic songs and they were left off the hook. They weren't popular enough. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, this album is amazing. Oh. What Every track is good, so I feel like I don't know which one to talk about. I could talk about one by one, like Stained Class is awesome, Invader, Saints in Hell. I can talk about my favorite song. Favorite are? So, my favorite Judas Priest song is on this album. It's Beyond the Realms of Death. Oh, is it? And it's, um, so Les Binks is the drummer that joined the band with this album. He brought that song to the band and uh, co-wrote it with Rob. So, I'm assuming Rob wrote, like, most of the lyrics. But um, it's, a, it's a favorite Priest song for me. It's a top five of all time song for me. Like, I just, I love the song. Of the three times I've seen them live, they played it live twice. The second time they played it, it was with uh, both, it was Glenn and uh, Richie, not KK, but they both nailed the guitar parts perfectly. I was sobbing by the end of it. It was like, oh my God, my life is complete now, having seen this song live. Oh, uh, it's cool that they still play uh, those songs. Live. Yeah. I don't know what their set list is like. I do know they don't play anything off Rock and Roll ever. Uh, incorrect. So when I saw them, they didn't for a long, long time. On this 50th anniversary, they played Rock Rolla. Holy crap. Yeah. That must have been magic. It was cool, but it sounded a little different live. Like they sped it up and it's a little heavier, of course. But um, um, but yeah, they do play that one song. Nothing else off of it, though. Hey, but. cool. My source is dated. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. They hadn't played it for a long, long time. But yeah, so Beyond the Realms of Death is just an incredible song. The lyrics are it emotional. Is. There's like, I don't know, four or five different solos. Um, we didn't talk about the twin guitar attack. All that much but Judas Priest definitely popularized it um, yeah they were about having more yeah let's do more exactly and you had KK with like he was a bit more of like if you hear an odd kind of guitar sound that's KK he, he likes to use his whammy bar quite a bit um, whereas Glenn was really more like bluesy and straightforward in his solo approach the two approaches just seem to mesh really well on most Judas Priest songs but in particular on this Judas Priest song mm. And yeah, so it's it's a perfect ten. Saints in Hell, um, Exciter, like there's so many great metal songs on here. Yeah, and I don't know why. Uh, I feel like younger metalheads don't are into the older priests, so I feel like they like the um, more the painkillers, <laughs> which sure. is cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But anyway, this, that, this is probably one of my favorites as well. Like the first three albums for me are the, that's the golden After rock and roll era. Yeah. yeah, two, three, and four. Yeah, I don't even <laughs> count rock and roll. <laughs> Come on now. Yeah. yeah, album two, three, four. But yeah, so we obviously we, we rated all three of them a 10, um, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. If you haven't listened to these albums yet, I mean, do yourself a favor. Start with Sad Wings and move on, you know, to uh, to Sin After Sin. And they were a different beast then. They they wrote good lyrics. I mean, the lyrics were True. meaningful. The songs had not just heaviness, but meaning and 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 an atmosphere. It wasn't just about like um, I don't know jugulators and all this. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was it was about I I don't know. It had. I agree with you. The it lyrics, had meaning. 70s Priest lyrics were my favorite for sure, absolutely. And in the 80s, they started to get more party-like. And it's not leather rebels silly. and stuff. <laughs> yeah, anyways. And we'll, yeah, we'll talk about Painkiller yeah. and those albums later. Okay, stay in class. I uh, also forgot to mention, this was released in February 1978. And that's important because our next album... <laughs> Killing Machine was released in October of 1978 uh, in, in, the, in Europe uh, and then released in February of 1979 in North America. So it had two release dates and it was called Hellbent for Leather. Kill Bent for Leather. Kill, <laughs> Kill Bent? <laughs> Killing Machine Bent for Leather. <laughs> so Killing Machine in, in Europe and I guess that was... Hell Bent for Machine. <laughs> I guess that was like Killing Machine was like too in your face for American audiences. I don't audiences. know, yeah. yeah. Man, fuck. When you read about it, it feels so stupid. It does. You're like, oh, they didn't like uh, the Killing Machine. It was too... Uh... But the word hell, I thought that was a bad... Yeah, let's use hell instead. <laughs> hell done for leather. Anyways, so two, uh, two album names and two different release dates depending where you lived in the world. Um, of course, you and I were too young when these albums came out, so we're, we have the benefit of looking back and seeing... Uh, those albums. This was a bit more commercial. Yeah, yeah. Just a nudge, just a nudge more commercial. What did you rate others. it? Oh, the rating. Yes. Nine. Okay. 9.5. Ah, okay. So we're pretty close. So we're a little dip. Uh, there's a little dip in there. there and is. Why? What's the dip? It's a little more commercial. Is that, is that what it is? Like I couldn't put my finger on it when I was thinking about it. It's the commerciality you of it. You feel the pressure of sales when you listen to it, maybe. <laughs> when you hear that it was named Hellbent for Leather instead of killing machine yeah that's a good point that's just one example true um that's definitely the present but that's you're right that's record label like uh pressure but that song is amazing hellbent for leather absolutely it's so cool yeah, yeah. Uh, a weird lyric though like hell like it's a weird like i don't know i feel like pre started getting weird with lyrics <laughs> um it's the song that rob always plays when he comes out on his motorcycle right so that became a staple in the Judas Priest Right, concert. yeah, it's the whole, yeah. yeah. It's part of their image, it's okay, it works. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't hate the song, I love the fucking song. <laughs> yeah. um, actually, I find that for this album, I, I think they were starting to sell records here. <laughs> Not a lot, but I think they were picking up momentum. True. Yeah. In a hard time, because uh, they were having a hard time because punk was a big thing in the late 70s in England. And, I mean, they weren't some big name, they weren't filling up stadiums. Um, You're right. Yeah, but they and but I still feel this album has a lot of like if when I hear um, yeah evil fantasies that's a song right yeah 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 evil fantasies to me sounds like a Danzig tune for some reason okay just that like mid pace kind yeah of. it's very bluesy it's yeah. mid mid tempo and it's evil <laughs> so it feels like Danzig for some reason that's an interesting comparison yeah um, obviously pre Danzig so it would have been. Uh... Take on the World feels like a Man of War song, <laughs> right? Yeah, it was like where Priest starts to get into these like crowd participation. Like yeah. we're all in this together. Yes. Defenders of the faith united we stand, you know. Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, honestly, that's some weird. I don't like that stuff. But I like the song. I like the song yeah. anyways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Delivering the Goods is, is a great song that became... Oh, Delivering the Goods is weird. Yeah. Why do you think it's weird? Well, I mean, I like the way he delivers the line. Like, Delivering the Goods. It feels yeah, yeah. like it's a bit, like, uh, like it shouldn't be in time, but it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Delivering the Goods. <laughs> it's a weird tempo, that song. Yeah. It's awesome. I love it. Yeah, That's yeah. one of my favorite songs on sure. there. I, I like um, Rock Forever. Um, I like Hellbent for Leather. 
Um, yeah, it's a great it's a great album. I mean, it's it's solid. And it was like I think half written by the the famous trio, the three guys, um, and then there's a couple other sprinkles. And it's the last album with drummer Les Binks. Ah, and Evening Star is a happy song. Evening Star. I'm like, yeah, it feels kind of happy. It does feel kind of happy, yeah. It's, and it's out of place like, a little bit Yeah. for this album in particular. Yeah. Maybe in maybe on British Steel it would have fit in a bit more or Point of Entry or something. But Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so... Great album. So I bitch a lot about it, but I love this album. Like, I love it. <laughs> you it's, gave it a nine, which is... I gave it a nine. That's a high water mark for sure. And uh, for me, at 9.5, there is that dip. I guess it's the commercial aspect of it, which you'll start to see in the 80s for sure. And maybe lyrical, lyrically. Yeah, and it... But it worked for Priest because this was, they started to sell more tickets and sell more records and, you know, people would go to the shows and uh, and then they exploded in the U.S., of course, in the 80s. So we'll... Okay, so that was the last of the 70s records. And we're going to move on to 1980. 1980, breaking the law. British Steel. Okay, what do you give this one? A British Steel for me is again a 9.5. No way. It is. I love this record. Eight for me. Eight. Okay, so a b- bigger decline for you, but I still, did. eight is still pretty solid. This is their black album. Yeah, yeah, this is very commercial sounding. It's not a sellout the way black album is viewed, I don't think, but it was definitely just because there wasn't. It's a huge shift in what they, what they were and what they are now true now they are a big commercial poppy sounding still super metal (laughs) for sure metal band yeah 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 but just they were selling like this was the big breakthrough yeah oh yeah absolutely it's where they like crystallized their image too with the leathers like they started to wear the leathers um rob had been wearing them and so was uh kk but it took a while to bring the the rest of the guys um it's the first one with dave holland on drums uh, of first of six. Yes. In for yeah. First producer Tom Allen. Tom Allen, who, who did a lot of their '80s albums, exactly. and who probably some people will argue that he ruined <laughs> Priest. Um, I won't say that, but no, uh, he's. I mean, his production is kind of wonky on some of the records, but um, on this one, I think it was fine. Um, yeah, the album sounds good. I mean, very produced. Weird songs like Metal God. I don't like Metal Gods. <laughs> it's the, so it's. Metal Gods is the one um, blight on the record for me. Like, I know it's like a popular song. They've played it live a bunch of times. I just, it is weird. It starts off with that weird clangy sound. It's supposed to be like robots walking or whatever, but it is a weird song. I'll give you that. But then it's got the rage on it, um, which has like really, really cool bass line. Probably my favorite song on that record for sure. And um, uh, one you know, top 10 pre-songs for me is The Rage is just incredible. They're talking a bit down to their fans on this one, though so their fans were, would have been adolescent teenage boys and they write songs like, "Don't I don't have to be old to be wise, <laughs> which is kind of like, I think where the 80s, it feels very 80s, like Twisted Sister did that, like we're not going to take it and we don't take this and we hate the PMRC and we don't have to be old to be wise and, yeah. and you know, screw you and all this. Like, I don't know, right? That's, that's interesting. I never really thought about it that way, but that's a good point. Um, they have a later song, Parental Guidance, that's kind of along the same lines, right? So Yeah, barf. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, yeah. but, okay, so I'm bitching too much. Breaking the Law is a cool track. I like Grinder. That's a cool song. Absolutely. Uh, I don't, Rap, I rap, like Living After Midnight. Rapid Fire, it's another like thrashy Rapid Fire song. is thrashy. Yeah. Um, the Rage is cool indeed. Uh, I don't even mind. You don't have to be old to be wise. I like it. I yeah. just, the lyrics are weird, but I like the song. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's like an eight. It's a solid record album, but um, I don't know. I feel like it's maybe their black album. Okay. They got very commercial. Very commercial. Agree. And like the sound for sure, commercial. United is that like, Arm in arm, like you want to sing along with that. <laughs> United, United. Anyways, it's got a very simple beat. It was definitely written for radio, probably influenced by Tom Allen. Um, the the album cover is iconic as well. It's like it's the guy's holding the blade, and uh, but there's no blood coming out. Yeah, so iconic album cover, iconic album. Recorded at uh, 
at um, Ringo Starr's house. Yes, that's true. And they thrashed it, I guess. Yeah. They broke beer, milk bottles. They broke milk bottles. Were they drinking milk? What? Anyway, but they broke, they smashed, they rode motorcycles on his lawn. They smashed some <laughs> bottles. And that's the smashing sound you hear on um, Breaking the Law. On Breaking the Law. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they were, they thrashed it. And that Metal God sound, it's like utensils being shaken in a box. Oh, or is something it? Like that. Yeah. Oh, that, I didn't know that. It's yeah. funny. But yeah, I forgot about the Ringo, um, which is pretty cool. I mean, well, it was Paul McCartney's house, I think, first, and he sold it to Ringo because, I don't know, tax thing, but anyway, yeah, yeah, who yeah. cares? Okay, British Steel, a couple other quick hits. It came out in 1980, and um, it came out simultaneously in North America and in Europe around the same time. But they did have different album uh, track lists. They were different in North America versus... Like uh, the order or? The order, yeah. So uh, this is a North American release. So you got Breaking the Law first because it's a very like radio friendly hit. I think Rapid Fire was the first track on the European, if I don't remember. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And there was a couple others that were mixed up. The British were ahead of. <laughs> More progressive, them. yeah. Yeah, another thing is what's interesting is we had a change of guard day eh, with metal. So you had, you had um, like Deep Purple and Black Sabbath or Uri Heat maybe. Uh, kind of like owning metal or the beginnings of it in the early 70s, especially Black Sabbath. But in the late 70s, early 80s, Sabbath was like getting bleh. <laughs> and, and Priest was out. Like Priest True. owned the land. And they toured like extensively, not only in, like in Europe and in, in North America and Japan. Yeah. Like they were a touring machine. Yeah. Sure. So just to mention, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Um, the last thing I want to mention about British Steel, I just remembered, is that... Um, it's the first album and the start of a trend where they just say all songs were written by the trio, like the Glenn, Rob, and KK. Right. And so that just continued up until Rob left the band. So we get we don't get to fight about songwriting credits. Yeah, exactly. Tipting, downing, Halford. So that takes Bob. us to 1981 or two. Point of entry, which cover? I didn't see the cover on, oh, that's yeah. your CD, right? Yeah, yeah. What cover do you have? Ah, you have the original. Yeah. The dot matrix printer paper <laughs> highway. That's what yeah. it is. <laughs> so this for me was a 7.5. I gave it a 7. Okay, so we're pretty close on that one. Yeah, 7. Uh, why? Why? Production is a bit more raw compared to... It's almost like they work really hard on British Steel and then they're like, they didn't have <laughs> anything less than it left in the tank and they just spit this out. It's, I mean, where British Steel was that commercial album and it's the start, the start of the rise of Priest, it feels like it was rushed. Like the label's like, hey, like get something out, guys. Like you got to capitalize your touring, get something new out there. I don't know how much was written before their recording session, how much was written during. I forget those details. There's, there's a few really good songs on here, like really good songs. Desert Plains for me. Oh, yeah, Desert Plains. It's an incredible song. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's, like, again, that's... Wow. That's top 10 that's why, for me. That's why this album is not like a five or a six. <laughs> Desert Plains, heading down to the highway. Heading, heading out, out to the highway. Heading out to the highway. Hot Rockin'. All, all the way, I don't mind. Hot, Hot Rockin', I like Hot too. Rockin' is the <laughs> dumbest video ever. <laughs> and by the way, we can mention this now. So now we have a band with a gay lead frontman. Not, op not out yet. Not out time. yet. Yeah. But uh, Halford, who... I don't care if he's gay. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't care. Yeah. But I'm just, just to put that out there. <laughs> but anyway, the point here is, so you had a gay front, closeted gay front man in a band who is instilling gay imagery and lyrics in the band. And it's kind of almost funny because you're like, how the fuck did they not know he was gay? <laughs> Yeah. Or why did no one mention it? That, that video for Hot Rockin', they're all in a sauna <laughs> with rocks. And they're training in the gym and they don't look like they go to the gym usually. <laughs> Their first and last time in the gym was to yeah. record the video. <laughs> um, so the point is just funny. It's just um, that what's actually interesting is so you have a metal band which is known for machismo, you know, mean energy and, uh, you know, sausage festivals, which kind of goes with good homoerotic imagery. So like, but what you have is just like a, a you know, a, like a subliminal gay messages. All if, if they should have been on trial, it was for all those subliminal gay images. <laughs> but um, surprisingly, wasn't. <laughs> but what are your thoughts on all that? I I don't. I again, I don't care either. Um, it's, yeah. it's cool for him. I know he's since he's come out. Um, it's 
uh, I think he lost. He probably lost some fans. I don't know. I don't know. But I think he also gained. Like I think there's people that look up to him, and um, he, I mean, he came out after it was okay to come out. I think a little bit too. Like, yeah. There was already other um, performers who had come out as gay, but in the metal world, it was pretty much unheard of. I think. Yeah. Um, but now, I don't know, we're in a much more progressive society now. Yeah, it's like, it's a who gives a shit. Ex- exactly. But when it came out, when he came out, it was a big deal. Yeah. Um, and uh, I didn't pay too much attention to the videos. I'm really, I care more about the music anyways. So. Had you seen the Hot Rockin' video? I, I think I have. There, it's Hot Rocks. Okay. <laughs> in the sauna. <laughs> I've maybe seen it once. I don't it's remember. It's silly. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, great. this is a kind of a good album, l- loosely. Yeah, I mean, there's some really forgettable songs on forgettable, here. Forgettable. Like, weak production. What is it, like On the Run and All the Way? All the Way. All the Way is okay. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, you like it. I don't, I guess. Um, or don't, don't Go is okay. It's just okay. It's okay. It's okay with some really good songs, like yeah. Desert Plains and Troubleshooter and yeah. Heading Out to the Highway. Like the. Um, I do like the vibe. I like the vibe on this album. Like I like the '80s, early '80s uh, production yeah. values and, and the way the guitar sounds. I, I like it on this album. I don't know how to describe it. A bit hollow. I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> I like it. So this album's done, and then we go they on to... get back on the horse and they come out with screaming. For vengeance. What do you give this? I gave this a 8.5. What? Yeah. I'm surprised. 8 point, yeah. And what, I mean, what, so what did you give it? Nine. Nine. Okay. So the first one of all the ones we've reviewed so far where I'm less than you. Yes. Um, this is the album that I think a lot of Priest fans are like, this is it. Yep. Number one right here. Yep. Right? Yeah, and I've always had a bit of a dissenting opinion on that one. Um, I prefer the next one that comes. This is like their master of puppets. <laughs> and the first three, the second, third, and fourth Priest albums, those are all like Ride the Lightning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting analogy. I'm just making loose analogies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like Power Slave, <laughs> right? Yeah. But the first three Priest albums are like Peace of Mind. <laughs> True. Yeah, that's a, that's a better analogy. Yeah, I mean, talk to me. Why do you think it's a nine? Uh, probably. You know why? Do you know what's one thing about this album? You put it in, and the first track. Well, I'm the gonna Hellion, be an idiot. The, the Hellion Electric Eye. Yeah, yeah, the Hellion Electric Eye. When that comes on, you're like, holy. Yeah. You're almost like blown out of your seat. True. It starts off very very high. Like it. If the rest stayed that consistent, this would be a top ten album for me for sure. Like that is a mind-bending heavy cool riff and yeah. song yeah just that intro like you just imagine seeing them live and like the house lights go down and like the the, the fog comes out yeah and, you know you hear the, the two guitars coming in yeah like when i die if there's like an afterlife that's what should play when i enter the afterlife like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then, right. it, and then it kicks into electric eye which is an yeah. incredible song yeah. yeah uh but so many good tracks on it um Bloodstone? You like Bloodstone? I like Bloodstone. I love Bloodstone. It's not my favorite, but it's a good song. Of course, Screaming for Vengeance. Title track. It's blistering like it's mad. You got another thing coming? You like you got another thing yeah, coming? Yeah, it's very pedestrian. They were going for that like commercial. Yes. Like I think it's probably the one you'll hear on the radio, if anything. <sighs> yeah. Um, they play it live quite a bit. It's a good sing-along. It's something grandmas say, like, oh, you got an- he's got another thing coming. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, it doesn't feel, I don't know, I don't like the lyric. It's it's weird, and what's weird is, like, all of, I, I heard this album in my formative years, right, as a teenager, and I always thought the saying was, you've got another thing coming, but it's actually, you've got an- another think coming, is the actual saying. Like, think again, you have another think coming. You'll, yeah, anyways. It's thing, it's not think. That's what they say, thing. Priest says thing. But the actual saying is, you've got another think coming. No. What? Yes, I'm blowing your mind right now, but that's a very true thing. Okay. Especially, I think, in the UK. I think it's very, it's a big deal to say, well, you, if, you, if that's what you think, you've got another think coming. But over time, it morphed into thing, and then... Okay, the original, the OG yeah, version we, of that. We know it as thing because we're priest fans, and that's where we would have first heard it. Especially... No, I would have first heard it from my grandma. 
But we're not native English speakers either, right? Well, so my grandma spoke mostly English. Oh, did she? Okay. Feels like a thing old people say. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, it's think you have another think coming. But <laughs> overall, the, it's a great song. I like it. It's it's fun. Uh, I think they played it live all three times I saw them, and it's always a fun, like crowd participation song. Yeah, I don't know. I love the cover too. Oh, and it has the, the theme of the upper left corner oh, down right. to the lower right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which They're, is the, the birds. Right. And yeah. I, I wish, I strangely, bizarrely wish they had all their album covers with that theme, but they only have a Three or bunch f- of them. Four. Yeah. Um, yeah, and yellow. What? <laughs> Not a lot of album covers are yellow and are cool. But it, it's, it, I don't know, it's cool. I don't know, I like the yellow. It was, it's different. It's, it's, a, it's different. It's very iconic as an album cover. It's, yeah, sure. iconic, yeah. The yeah. eagle. Yeah. Who doesn't like an eagle? <laughs> and, um, I mean, it's, I think it's influenced some later bands. Like, there's a Canadian band called Riot City. Um, they're from Alberta, Calgary or Edmonton, I forget. But they have an album from a couple years ago called Burn the Night. Uh, it's very, very, I mean, obviously Priest was a huge influence on them because you hear it in the music, but you also see it on the album cover. It uh, looks very much like this album cover. Uh, and then their their latest album, Priest's latest album, Firepower, also calls back to the yellow and the theme, and your, that left to right slash that you're talking about. Amazing album, though. It's the fan favorite, I believe. But, yeah, I think you're right. I, I, I think my... Where I rate it is unpopular for most Priest fans, probably. Um, I, lo- I still love the album, absolutely. It's a great album. There's a couple songs like Fever I don't really care for, and maybe Pain and Pleasure I don't care. Yeah, for. yeah, 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 yeah. So those are two. Like, I don't find they make a dent for me in the aesthetic of the album. Somehow, somehow, for some reason, those two tracks, and while they do, they are kind of dull, I don't feel like I still want to put this album on all the time. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. weird. Yeah. All right, so that's it for 1982's Screaming for Vengeance. Onward to 1984 with Defenders of the Faith, which is, for me, a perfect 10. No! Yeah, I was going to say, big fan favorite for this one, I noticed just researching that people have a pure love for this album. I don't give it a 10. I give it an 8.5. Oh, okay. So I, I think it's, um, it might merit a bit more, but that's where I put it. Okay, yeah, interesting. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so <laughs> um, one thing, so this was uh, Priest's ninth record, and it's Defenders of the Faith, D-O-T-F. And Iron Maiden's ninth album was Fear of the Dark, F-O-T-D. <laughs> It's just, oh Jesus! It's just something I noticed because I like to use. It initials. almost sounds like sports statistics. Like yeah, this yeah. player is the thirty-fourth player to play the ninth <laughs> of the inning at exactly. the whatever the. So, anyways, uh, interesting, and they were you know six years apart or whatever it was. So nice. Um, yeah, Defenders of the Faith is a perfect ten for me. Um, it was when I went after. So I, I talked about Ram It Down, Painkiller, and then I went back to the earlier stuff. Um, this is the album that first really resonated with me. Um, it's heavy for sure. The Sentinel. The oh yeah, the Sentinel is top like, ten pre songs. Like, like it's, the Sentinel it's amazing. is like the pre song. It's yeah. on this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. It's a, such a great song. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean that uh, that alone should merit at least a couple points uh, increase. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but it's, it kicks off with free will free will burning, which is a great Good. song. It's yeah. fast. Yeah. It's got that. Um, Rob's lyrical delivery is like really fast in this one part. Like, look before you leap. It's never been the way we keep her was free. Like, I'm nice. Not, hey, you yeah. got that. Um, I, I just, it's just, it's such a great song. It's iconic. They played it live a bunch of times. Um, they, we didn't mention it with uh, screaming, screaming for vengeance, but they were really rising, especially in the U.S. back in the early '80s, and they did a lot of live. Like, they toured all the time. And there's a a a, a live vengeance release that they did from 1982 or '83. That's uh, iconic. And then they did an actual proper live album uh, after Turbo uh, where they played a lot of Defenders material and it just comes across so great, especially the Sentinel and Free Wheel Burning. Like they just come across really well live, um, which for me as a impressionable teenager made me want to see them live. Um, and yeah, so many great songs, Jawbreakers on here. What's all the breakers, like ball breaker, jawbreaker, star breaker? <laughs> Oh yeah, that's true. Like why is anyway? <laughs> I know Ball Breaker was not them, but 
And yeah, so for me, there's not a dud on this record. I love no, all the dud, songs. No, a dud. I don't know. Love bites. I I love that song too. Oh, I like Eat Me Alive. Yeah, Eat Me Alive is great. <laughs> <laughs> ah, some heads are gonna roll. It's like a bit. It's a mid tempo. Yeah, and you know what? They didn't actually write that one. It was another guy. Um, like they wrote. So uh, this continued the trend of of KK, Rob, and Glenn writing all the music. Except for some heads are gonna roll. It was written by Bob. Someone. I don't uh, like heavy duty. I like heavy duty. The heavy duty. <laughs> and then Defenders of the Faith, the title track is very um, kind of like United, like it's you know very much like we're it's an anthemic metal song. Yeah. Um, th- but they didn't really play it live all that much, which is kind of strange. Rock hard, ride f- free. That was supposed to be on Scream for Vengeance as Fight for Your Life. Oh, really? That was a song, Fight for Your Life, which you can get on, uh, I think, the remasters. Okay. But they didn't put it on that. They oh. rewrote the song as as rock, rock Hard, Ride Free. Okay. All day, all night. I wonder, I'd really like to get your impression on the first version, which is a different song, but the same song. Okay. Like, different lyrics and a bit different. I've I've heard most of, like, the bonus tracks, and so I don't remember it. Maybe I didn't catch that it was a rewrite. Yeah. But interesting. I'll have to go back and check that out. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, well, one last thing I want to mention, one, one other thing I want to mention is Eat Me Alive was on the PMRC's Filthy 15, oh, yeah. <laughs> which was ridiculous. The only thing that represents for me looking back at that is that Judas Priest were popular. They were on a list with Madonna and Prince. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> like Judas Priest was on that list with Cindy fucking Lopper and, you know, whatever else was on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For Eat Me Alive! <laughs> Anyway, that's, that's it's, it's ridiculous. Oh, because the line, I'm going to force you at gunpoint to eat me alive. Correct. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's like, what is even the point of that? Yeah. The PMRC Spilty 15. Um, so the album cover, I want to talk about the album cover. It's also pretty iconic. Um, it looks like a boss you would fight in Mega Man 2. Yeah, no shit. Right? I always it thought does. That. Yeah, yeah. It does. Um, I like when you open it, you can see the whole whatever it's supposed to be. Yeah. Some weird, like, giant monster machine yeah like what is it almost looks like a hot dog <laughs> this looks like a hot dog uh one I thing had hot dogs yesterday so that's why i'm thinking i talked about how um like judas priest is very much kk glenn and rob and on this album in particular they gave no love to the other two so dave holland the drummer and no uh, and ian hill the bass guitarist check this shit out oh what the three Oh, they put them there. Ian and Dave are up here. Like, as an afterthought. Oh, we forgot the other guys. Let's put them up here. Jesus. <laughs> and I have this on vinyl, right? So when I pulled out the vinyl, it's very prominent because this is what you see. Like, you don't see this lower part, but you see this. That's funny. <laughs> anyway, so come on, guys. Show some love for Ian, especially Ian. So Ian Hill is the only band member who's consistent throughout all of Priest Records. He's there uh, when Rob leaves. He's there when Rob comes back. He was there on the last record. And he'll be there on the next one if they do one. Yeah, he's been kind of invisible. Yeah. Right? Or you tell me, what was... No, you're right. Um, So when you see them live, um, the two guitarists are very prominent. You've got Rob in the middle, drummer behind him. So it's probably KK and Glenn, if I'm remembering correctly. And you had Ian, who was kind of between Glenn and the drummer, whoever the drummer is at the time, Scott Travis now. Um, kind of just in the background doing his thing. And it, when I would see them live, I would okay, I like I, I like the sound of the bass, right? So I'd always look to Ian to see what he's doing. And he's just kind of strumming along. And occasionally he does like a tilt with his guitar, and that's pretty much <laughs> it. And he tilts his hair a little bit. But he's cool. I think he's cool. He's very cool, but I think he's just quiet. He's just happy doing his thing. Mm. Uh, he just lets Rob and Glenn and KK do all the writing because I, I guess he's, maybe he's not interested in doing some writing. I think he does have a couple of writing credits, like, early on. He does. Yeah, and then maybe later not on, much. too. Yeah, not much. But he's just, like, a rock, and Priest probably needed they that. They need a rock. Yeah. They and, need to rock. And I don't know, he probably played a role in getting Rob back with the band, I'm guessing. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, they, they did him dirty with that, uh, with that uh, inside album art. Let's move on. To 1986. This is this would be um, the one everyone bitches about until at least 
some other albums that come out in the 90s. 1997? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, so Turbo, um, I give it a 9 out of 10. So this one, uh, I give it a 6. Oh, a 6 out of 10, okay, interesting. Mm, 6. Yeah. 9 <laughs> and 6 were probably the we're way off. Of, we're 9 the is apart. weird, but I know like some fans love this album, so I, I'm not surprised, yeah. but I... I don't find it's really that that great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, yeah. So for me, I'll because I love the record. I'll talk about it more. Um, That's where you're getting back to me for um, you saying that um, Virtual Eleven oh, yeah. was the terrible, terrible, and I had some redeeming qualities. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you're giving this some redeeming qualities it, because a, Judas Priest, your favorite band. I don't even need to redeem it. <laughs> and beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Sure. I mean, maybe I'm a priest apologist, but I just... You're a priest apologist. I love this record. It's, it's, it's a fun summer record. Um, it's just fun sounding. I want to listen to it on a hot day and drink beer. And, um, you know, it's Turbo Lover, the title track. The lyrics are cheesy, sure, but it's such a great song. And when the second time I saw them live, they played it live. And it, I was so excited. I was like giddy. I was just excited to hear Turbo Lover live. They have, um, this album introduced the synthesizers, so they use the guitar synths quite a bit. It's pretty heavy. Um, it's more pronounced in some songs, like Out in the Cold. It's very Yeah, pronounced. so it's like 1986, right? Yeah, so very 80s sound. That's when uh, Somewhere in Time came out with synths yep. as well. Synths were huge in the 80s. Absolutely. Pop and synths were huge, and pop metal bands, probably especially Priest, they were pretty commercial. They hit that. Yeah. Um, I think, honestly, that... I would say Maiden fared better with Somewhere in Time on their synths than agree. this. This is like almost like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> I like Locked In though. Okay, yeah, that's a great song. That's, I love Locked In. That's a cool song. It is a good song. Yeah. A bit glammy. Yeah. Like there, there, there's some glam influence here. Big time. Sleaze. Yeah. Um, but did you like, you liked some glam metal, right? Like, yeah, I do like some like glam metal. Motley Crue and Poison and... I do like Motley Crue. I like Extreme. Um, and Poison, I have a weird like for it. It's just like I had a friend who listened to Poison a lot in grade 7 and I made him a t-shirt. When I went to Bangor, Maine, I made him a shirt that said you could print shirts back then. You'd pay and yeah, they yeah. would print you a shirt. and It was like the biggest thing. And I made him a shirt, a Poison shirt that on the back said CC rules. Nice. <laughs> that was my the limit of my imagination in seventh grade. Okay. Well, he does rule. He's a great guitarist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it is glammy, it is commercial, it is poppy. Um, I don't know a lot of people who love the record as much as I do. We do. We both collectively know one person, Crawl. It's his favorite uh, Priest record. Um, does he like the other ones? No. Like he does, but not as much. This is his favorite. So. Watch, you're watching Crawl? Yeah. You're just do, you're trolling everyone when you say this Going is Going against the album. green, yeah. But anyways, yeah, I love the record. It's super fun for me. Um, even parental guidance, which you, you went earlier, like oh my god, yeah, That's, the, that has no business being here. The lyrics are pedestrian, absolutely. But when you hear it, like if you so if you go to that '87 Priest live record I mentioned, they play it live, and it just comes across really well live. Maybe on the record, not as much, but it's I don't know, it's it, it fits in with that fun summerish theme that that this album gave me. It came out I think in April of '86, so it was like just before the summertime. So I'm sure it was a big like, I'm sure a lot of Trans M's were playing it with the top down in 1986 during the summer. and um, Yeah, posers. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> posers with Trans M's were playing this in 1986. And again, this one of the themes we were talking about is how you and I came into Priest later, sure, around yeah. Painkiller time, right? So um, we have the, the luxury of looking back and yeah. we weren't shocked by this album when it came out. I'm sure if, yeah. if, I, was a, if I was a Priest fan in 84 and then this came out, I would probably... Well, I'll tell you thing. when Risk came out, Megadeth wrote Risk, I wasn't playing that in my Trans Am. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, right? Um, or Dodge Neon or whatever the fuck it was <laughs> yeah, yeah. in the 90s. <laughs> whatever the cool car was. Yeah. Well, one thing I'll mention is, uh, well, first the cover, I think it has the diagonal. Yeah, it has the diagonal. See, what the fuck? And, um, and I think the same guy who did Screaming and Defenders probably because they all look kind of similar-ish. Yeah, but I love that theme. Uh, but uh, another thing is this was supposed to be a double album. Yes, okay, Twin Turbos. Twin tur which actually is kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, the, the record label did not like the idea, 
So it was gonna be a double album of half like soft shit like this, and the other half would have been heavy shit like Ram It Down. Yep. yep. But instead they broke it up. That's true. Okay, good point. Good. I'm glad you called that out. I forgot about it. Twin Turbos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I found that fascinating. Uh, it probably would have, the label was probably right. It would have been a failure commercially, <laughs> an, a double album. You, you gotta have magical something to do a good double album. I don't know. True. I don't know who you gotta be, but. Not Judas Priest. But not Judas Priest. <laughs> At least not in 1986. And probably not in 2008 either, but we'll get to that. Yeah. I don't like a lot of double albums, honestly. I don't. We need to do a video about that. The ones we like? Yeah. It's true, there's not a lot of good ones in metal. Yeah. So what else? That's it. Turbo. 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 We'll go to the twin turbo of... Yeah, the, the twin turbo. The heavier Ram It Down from 1988. Do you like the cover on this one? Yeah, it's pretty metal. Like it's. Yeah, it's like a, the earth a, being a, smashed. By a fist. What do you give this? Uh, I give this an eight. Seven. Okay, we're closer. Yeah. Which is great. This feels like it's a prototype for Painkiller. Yeah. Like the, the sound, the, the, the drum sound is really heavy. True. Like the, the album is actually really heavy. It is. And so is Painkiller. It feels like they were like going a bit of a new direction production wise. Uh, Tom Allen is still here since uh, British Steel. British Steel. He's, yep. Tom Allen has been producing since then. Yep. Um, and I think he's made some mistakes. I feel like um, there's some on this one. I, yeah, I agree. Probably one of the reasons I gave it a lower score is the production. Um, I mentioned before, Ram It Down was my first Priest album, so I love it for that reason. Like I, I've got nostalgia associated with it. But looking back at the whole Priest catalog and what they could sound like versus what they sounded like here, I can see there's some flaws, production-wise especially. It, it is heavy. You're right. It's This is probably their heaviest record to date, like in terms of like true heaviness. But there's something missing. And to me, the something is the production and the drumming. Um, Dave Holland, this was his last record. He was great and he, he yeah. got them through the 80s, but he didn't have what Priest needed to go to that next level. And we'll talk about that with the next record. But um, So for me, drumming and production is kind of what's lacking. Guitars are really good though. Like the solos are amazing. They're blistering. You've got Ram It Down. You've got Heavy Metal. You've got... I don't like Heavy Metal, but do you like Hard as Iron? That's I like Hard as that's Iron. That's the one I like. Yeah, it's a great song. Yeah. Uh, even like the lyric, hard as iron, sharp as steel. Um, it sounds very 80s, but also heavy. Like, I don't know. Yeah, it's a good track. Great song. Yeah. I like the Johnny B. Good cover, of course. I know it's a dividing thing with some people. Okay. I have something to say about that. So I, I'm not sure who made the decision exactly, but they wanted... This album was too heavy. And they wanted something uplifting on it. So they recorded Thunder Road for this album. But they wanted something a bit lighter, so they put Johnny Be Good in its place. Which probably, I think a lot of people like that cover, the Johnny Be Good one, you included. But Thunder Road is like one of my favorite <laughs> Priest songs ever. It is so good. Okay. I wish I, so badly it was on this. If it was on this, I would bump this album like by a point or two. I maybe make it an this. eight or 8.5. I, I don't know if I've heard Thunder Road. It only came out in 2001. On the remasters. Okay. Actually, I was kind of dumb because when I heard it, I actually thought, where did I see it? Which album did I see it on? I think I think they released it on the 2001 remaster of uh, uh, Point um, Point of Entry. Oh, okay. So, but it's supposed to be what it was supposed to be for this album. Okay, interesting. <clears throat> I hope I'm what I'm saying makes sense and I'm right, but <laughs> but I triple checked that. Yeah. <clears throat> But, um, but Johnny B. Good was used in a movie? Uh, yeah, yeah. It was um, a Brad Pack movie. No. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it hindered or helped her popularity, but there it is. I, I think it's a cool cover. They make it heavy. It's a classic Chuck Berry song, but they yeah. just they metalize yeah, it's, it. Yeah, it's not terrible. Yeah. And it, it's also the last cover song they do on any Priest album. So they had the three in the 70s, and then they had this one. Yeah. yeah. So it's okay. It's a good album. Whatever. Blood Red Skies. What did you think of that song? Uh, I didn't care for it that much. Okay. Maybe it was okay. It's long. Like it's a seven minute song. It's very atmospheric. Um, I love the song. And I, they just happened to play it live the last time I saw them. And it came across really well live. I'm not going to I'm not faring very well with song names. I'm admitting it here. Okay. Um, one, one thing I did do last week is I listened to every Priest album chronologically. And I rated each song track by track. Oh, okay. Interesting. 
And then I sorted by track my rating for each song. Okay. And that kind of helped me to rank the album. Yeah. So if I don't remember that song, it's because I didn't. I really. It was. Didn't. It was forgettable for you. Mm-hmm, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> but yeah, overall, I think it's a solid album, and uh, it was a step in a heavier direction. That I did notice. Yeah. Okay, we're off to the godly territory. One last thing on this album. This is almost 50 minutes long. 50? Yeah, yeah. This at, the, at this point, this was their longest album. Most of their albums are between 36 to like 47 True. minutes. This one's like getting close to 50. This is, I don't know why metal bands do this. Their, their albums get progressively worse sometimes, some bands. <laughs> but they're adding more. It's yeah. like more is not better. Add, cut, trim the fat. I think they, I don't know. It's We're entering the CD era, right? Late 80s. I mean, the CDs were out in the early that 80s. That could be, but yeah. CDs were taking over vinyl in yeah. the late 80s. Um, so, you know, CDs can fit 80 minutes of music, right? And if you're if you were wanting to do 80 minutes on a, in music with a vinyl, you're talking two or three LPs. So um, that's probably part of it. Um, but interesting observation. So we go from the soundtrack to my junior high to the soundtrack to my high school. Like this album literally came out the the week I started high school and I bought it that week. And um, it was the soundtrack to high school for me. Uh, so Judas Priest Painkiller, 1990. What do you give this? It is a perfect 10. I gave it a 9. Oh, that hurts. Yeah, I mean, okay, interesting. Even You're like, nine, okay, well, no. Nine, nine is still a good score on an album, but... Like, Almost perfect. It's a perfect 10 to me. Um, just, I mean, look at that album cover, right? The album cover is is as metal as it gets. Um, I have a personal reason why I really love the album cover as well. Um, I have a, a my best friend who passed away that year in 1991. Um, didn't like metal, but he knew I liked metal, so he was drawing that album cover for me on this like giant piece of paper. Don't know where that ended up, but um, anyways, yeah, so uh, personal connections to this album, of course, but the music, I mean, okay, Painkiller, the drums. That so song is a 10. Scott fucking Travis, the, the new drummer. Yeah, he band, just starts out. He he's, he's kicks he's off He's like, I'm new here. What, what, what can I do? Yeah. He's like, yeah, we'll tell you. <laughs> and like the drummer was always in the back seat with Priest, but here they put him right at the forefront. And uh, wow, does he ever deliver. Yeah. And then the next two albums, they're like, fuck you, Scott Travers. <laughs> yeah. But no, but on this album, yes, of course. And Painkiller, wow. like you said, it's a top 10, it's a 10, perfect 10 song. Perfect It's 10. an iconic That song is song. like an 11, really. Yeah. I mean, if, you, if you're not familiar with the song, I mean, go, <laughs> go watch any YouTube reaction videos to this song and you'll see people flip out. Yeah, like, and, and we're talking about that song, but I mean... Hell Patrol jumps in next. It's amazing. All Guns Blazing, amazing. Leather Rebel. Oh. Amaz- amazing. <laughs> Metal M- Meltdown. Oh, not bad. Nightcrawler's awesome. It is. The, the lyrics are dumb. I'm sorry. Nightcrawler. People Metal Meltdown. I mean, we're talking really dumb lyrics. That's where. That's one thing I feel. So in 1990, you had like um, Metallica writing really meaningful, mindful lyrics. So was Megadeth with Rust in Peace. You know, political stuff like... Um, I don't know, you had really, you had, and then you have Metal Meltdown. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't... I, it, you're right, I mean... They're lacking. That's my point. That's my point. True. My one point off, that's my nine. And we didn't get into the lyrics too much on the 80s albums, but, like, on Turbo, the lyrics are pretty dumb. Um, yeah. Ram It Down, they're a little better. Painkiller, there's some, but you're, you're right. They're talking about, like, these fantasy beasts flying on motorcycles in the sky and... And people will, I'm going to get a lot of shit for saying all this, but like, they'll say, oh, but Judas Priest always been like that. But no, they, they haven't. They were, they could write amazing lyrics yeah, if the, they wanted to. In the, I, the 70s album. I think they were about. being, I think they were just feeding their fans what they thought their fans wanted. Yeah, true. But it worked for me as a 14 year old. Ah, uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. Painkiller, this is cool. This guy's awesome. I want to drive that motorcycle. Actually, Painkiller is amazing. I wouldn't change the lyrics on it. No, like, absolutely. It's perfect. Yeah. And Halford's delivery on it. Right down to the last extended scream, like, ah. Anyways, um, they played Painkiller all three times I saw them live. The second time in in, uh, seven years ago, I recorded, I was front row, and I recorded Rob singing it, and he was perfect. I saw him again. Uh, He overcame cancer. We didn't talk about that. He beat cancer a couple years ago, and he's back, obviously, performing. But he's aged. 
Um, so they played Painkiller. He didn't hit the same high at the end that he did back in 2015, but he still delivered. I remember checking this. So um, Halford had a six octave range in the peak of his career. And now he probably still has like a four octave range, something like that. Okay. I don't know a lot about what all that means, <laughs> but I think it's pretty impressive from what I gather. Yeah, yeah. But everyone's range drops when they get older. Yeah. It's normal. Yeah, yeah. And it's acceptable. And I feel like a lot, and Priest, I feel, compliment Halford. They tune down a bit for their later albums. Yeah. yeah so yeah. he still sounds amazing. Absolutely. But on this album, like, he's, <laughs> wow. <laughs> And uh, we, so we said Scott Travis's first album, Rob Halford's last album for at least a couple. Yeah, that's weird, eh? Yeah, there was some incident afterwards. There was always tension brewing in the camp. And obviously that spilled out, I think, at the Toronto show when uh, I think he hit his head coming out on his motorcycle or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty bad, yeah. whatever that was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that motorcycle accident. But that, it wasn't that. Like, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, but yeah, like... I love every song on this album. There's, for me, not a dud. I love Metal Meltdown. I love Leather Rebel. The guitars on that are amazing. Um, I love One Shot at Glory, the way they end the album. It's very, like, epic sounding. It starts off with, like, a atmospheric kind of intro, and then it builds up to this, like, rocking, fist-pumping song. And uh, I just, yeah, I fucking And it was a big it. album, and it was successful, and yep. it, they sold a ton of him, which is I, weird because I, the, this is, like I said, at the time when... You know, uh, metal was changing. There was a change of guard happening. Uh, Priests weren't on top anymore. You had the Megadeth, the Metallica, Pantera was coming up. And like, you, they just were not really, like, ram it down there. Nobody cared. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, like, just when they, everyone thought they, they were done for. No. Painkiller. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Heavy, that's cool. Heavy as fuck. Heavy as fuck. Mean. And they're in their own way. Um, yeah, I remember having the cassette. I had the cassette and I remember being at my buddy Claude's house and Don had it in the old ghetto blaster or something. And I don't know what was happening exactly. I don't remember, but we were drinking and somebody kicked the ghetto blaster up in the air and it was like flying through the air. It was like faster than a laser. <laughs> and then it fucking smashed and the song stopped. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. I'll always remember that. It's probably less cool than when it happened because I, I remember the song stopped and we're like, fuck, fix it, fix it. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, pretty metal actually yeah <laughs> but yeah this was a good time for for metal in 1990 not the rest of the yeah. 90s but just 90 uh, uh yeah it's i think it's their heaviest record to me it's it's their heaviest they never equaled it um one of their best we'll talk about our ranking at the end like you mentioned so we'll see where it fits in the in that but i mean yeah what else can i say about painkiller fucking great album go listen to it yeah then okay so then after this yeah so rob leaves the band at the i think it was 91 rob leaves during that everybody left day. rob left bruce dickinson left <laughs> after fear of the dark in 1990 yeah that's everybody's right. leaving everywhere so. yeah it was a weird time everybody quits and it was a metal weird, dies it was a weird time for metal metal died in the early 90s grunge took over and people wanted to do grunge and rob wanted to do his own thing and so he went on and did uh how, two two and fight fight yeah. I got one of them. I think I have two. And we should mention, we're not talking about two or fight. We're not going to cover their albums. Sure, yeah, we won't bother. Like KK's Priest, like, we can talk about them, but we're not going to. We're really just talking about the Priest discography. Yeah. So we're going to skip over seven years. Yeah, seven years they didn't do anything. Their longest... What were they doing? What was Priest doing for seven years? Longest period. Were they period. golfing? They were golfing. No. Do they, they golf? They were golfing. Who golfs? Glenn and KK. <laughs> I think KK asked Glenn, hey, you guys, you want to just golf for a few months? And that's what they did. <laughs> Swear to God, that's what they did. <laughs> and then John you later. <laughs> but in that time, they had to find a new singer. Yeah. And how do you replace the metal god? Wait, Rob fucking Halford. What do you give this album? So I gave, okay, I gave it an 8.5. I gave it a 4. 4, okay. Yeah, that okay. was not an uncommon rating at the time. So you, so why who's who is Ripper? So yeah, so uh, they had to find a new singer to replace Rob. How do you replace Rob? You can't really, but they they did. So um, I think there was a few guys in the running. Sebastian Bach from Skid Row was one of them, and then his agent turned down the Priest Camp without even talking to Sebastian. And then 
he left Skid Row like a few months later. But anyways, so he was in the running. Ralph Sheepers from Primal Fear, who sounds yeah, a lot like Rob Halford, cool. was yeah. he was in the running and he thought he was getting the job. I think he was pretty bummed out he didn't get it. Mm. And then they were, they heard I don't know how they heard about this guy. A cassette. Somebody had a VHS yeah. cassette. Maybe it was Scott Travis of the cover band Ripper in the cover band. We didn't mention. And then Mark Wahlberg made a movie. Scott Travis, when he joined as the drummer, is an American. Yeah. The first American in the band. Yeah. And then Tim Ripper Owens is the second American. Right. Um, so he they found Tim through this tape or whatever. He was yeah. in a Priest cover band. Yeah. Had his own band, but he killed on the Priest songs. He yeah. You know, people rip on Ripper, but he is an amazing vocalist. Absolutely. He is an amazing freaking vocalist. He is underutilized here or misused. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think he's greatly used, but um, okay, we can talk about that. But um, well, they didn't they didn't involve him in any of the songwriting, so he's not singing true. his own thing. Correct. It's yeah. like, what the hell am I singing about? Jugulators and what the fuck? Yeah, good point. So uh, up until this time, it was always Rob K K Glenn. Now they're like, yeah, it's just me. They're on the golf course, like writing songs. Yeah. Okay. First album with a new singer. First album without a good producer. They got Tipton produced it. Yeah. First album in the 90s when metal sucks. First time Halfer's not there writing songs. Yep. It's a perfect storm, this album. No wonder it failed. It did fail. Too, too much crap going on. It did fail. One thing at a time. I, I personally loved it. I felt that they took the heaviness from Painkiller and kept it going. Like, it's still as heavy as Painkiller. Um, the drumming is still great. Um, Bullet Train is, like, my favorite. Probably my favorite song on the album. Ugh. I think they should have led with that one because it starts off with like, you really hear Ripper Owens coming in. Like it's kind of like, it's yeah. a fade in and you hear his voice like really low and then coming in. I think it would have been a better introduction to his voice. I like, actually, I don't mind the song Jugulator. Yeah. That's the one track I don't mind. The pedestrian lyrics are kind of like, my, okay, my problem with the record is the lyrics are terrible and the production's not the greatest. It sounds like if you watched wrestling in the 90s it sounds like every wrestler's entrance music <laughs> like down tune chug a chug yeah. guitars um you know new new metal um that's what the 90s were for it it wasn't heavy metal anymore it was hard hard music or whatever <laughs> they were calling yeah, it yeah. they were calling it hard music True. um so f- fuck all those days but to me and it was this, metal. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, it still this is, it still has some pieces of priest in there, especially on Jugulator. I find, but mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't like it. Yeah, I mean, how many times? How many tries did you give it? I listened to this album many times. Okay, okay. I bought this when it came out. I think. Okay, yeah. And you were disappointed on the onset. Well, I never liked it that much. Okay. <laughs> but I've listened to it at least 30, 40 times. And yeah. you think, are you nuts? But yeah, I, I didn't have Spotify in 97. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had the CDs I bought. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I loved it at the time. Um, Metallica had that, at that point released Load, I think. Just Load, not Reload. Yeah. And Load was, in later years, I appreciated Load, but I, I didn't like it when it first came out. And I thought Priest might go in that kind of direction as well, but they kept it heavy like Painkiller. So for that reason, I was okay, like, this is cool. Um, I loved Rob Halford. He was my favorite singer. I was bitter about a new singer coming in, but I liked the new guy. I actually did. Um, I think they had a better pick for a singer than Iron Maiden picked. Yes. Not that not that Blaze Bailey isn't a good singer. He's he's just not that good in Iron Maiden. He's much better in like when on 10th Dimension. Check him out on 10th Dimension or other stuff he's done. He's great. He's a great singer. He just wasn't a good fit. But for Ripper, he's a perfect fit. Yep. It's just they changed the formula. <laughs> he was a great fit. You're right. He fits better. Um, even like there was complaints about Blaze's live performances. Like he couldn't perform some of the Bruce Dickinson songs very well. But if you listen to 98 Live Meltdown by Priest, the Priest live record, like Ripper fucking delivers the goods sure. on all the songs. Yeah. And he took like the Diamonds and Rust cover and carried it because they do it acoustically on that album. And like Ripper carries it. And I love the songs on this album. I would love to hear Rob sing them someday, but he's like a total diva about those years. Like he won't, in his book, confess. He basically refuses, he refused to listen to it at the time. 
and still refuses to this day to listen to either of those albums. What does he want them to band to do? Die? And, th and that's to me that's disrespectful to his band yeah. members, right? Why like, does he do that? Glenn and KK wrote those songs. They're his friends. Yeah. At least listen to the fucking thing, and then maybe you're gonna like one of them. Like Cathedral Spire, it's the last song on this album. I'd love to hear Rob belt that out. Mm. Or uh, Bullet Train or Jugulator, like any of those. Bruce songs. has sung those right. songs. Bruce hasn't been a diva. He has sung no. Klansman and Sign of the Cross. Like he does those songs. So I don't know. I feel like Rob's being a bit of a diva on that. And you won't even hear this or their next album on Spotify because he doesn't want them there. Uh, they're not on YouTube Music either. Right? Because. It's like he wants to erase that part. Maybe it's not him; it's his manager. But I don't know. Yeah, they want to erase that, like Jane Andrews, I think. Or yeah, yeah. Um, but anyways, yeah, I think to me this is a great album. I loved it then. I love it now. Uh, another little. Would minor... you give it eight point five? Yeah, you're nuts. I'm not nuts. It's a great record. Good. <laughs> the guitars are awesome. The solos are great. No. Scotch drumming is great, and Ripper's vocal delivery is great. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but anyways. I know your rating is more in line with what most people think. Maybe this is the priest apologist in me coming out, but yeah. I really love the record. Um, and it's not my least favorite priest record. So. Okay. Um, one thing I'll mention too is that the album cover, they like zoomed in on the guy, on that metal I guy. know, it's terrible. And it, yeah, you can, even like this, you can see it's like... It's pixelated. It's pixelated. Or... But when you look at the inside tray... It's better. Yeah, I know. Why Beautiful. Like, yeah. why did they make that the album cover? Yeah. I don't know if you can see it, but um, yeah, yeah. They that that's a what these decisions? Who makes these decisions? <laughs> so, anyways, um, they also changed the priest logo with this album, which I'm not it's a big fan. It's on the fan back of. there. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of it. It's kind of like a weird. Um, it's okay. It's so Scott got his first writing credit on this album. We're at oh. Red Demolition. Oh, yeah. This is a four. Judas Priest Demolition. Also a four. Yeah, now you're making sense. Oh, hold on. But I upgraded it to a seven Fuck. this week. Maybe, Jesus Maybe Christ. I'll temper that later, but I started off as a four. This, to me, was like No Prayer for the Dying was during our Maiden discography. Is it was painful. Well, No Prayer for the Dying ain't new metal. It was painful for me to listen to um, at first, but it grew on me. Like I kept thinking, oh, I got to... Give this album a little more justice. And it's, I, I would say up until the last two years, um, I ignored this record. I probably played it twice. I fucking hated it. Yeah. Like, I love Jugulator, but I hated Demolition. The album cover sucks. It's their worst album cover. It's not even art. It's like someone just did it quickly in Microsoft Paint. Like it, they, they didn't have time to do an al actual proper art. So they just threw this together. It's like they weren't taking things seriously, maybe. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, and they their label... Oh, yeah, and they weren't on Columbia either. They lost Columbia or whatever happened there. Yeah. So they didn't have Columbia on Jugulator or this. They're an like SPV, SPV, which is like a smaller, indie label, I They've think. They've since gone defunct. Like they don't, they don't exist anymore. Yeah. Um, Tipton is sole producing these pieces of shit. <laughs> uh, the songs were... Glenn, KK, and then um, Scott wrote Cyberface, which is a stupid title. Cyberface. Decent song. So, okay, you mentioned New Metal. Yeah, there's like... Jekyll not, and Hyde. It's not a Judas Priest record to me. It's more like they took a little bit of Ramstein, a little bit of Alice in Chains, a little bit of Slipknot or Corn or some shit. They made a Swamp Juice. It, and it just, it came out as a bit of a mess. And I, I did. I hated it for many, many, many years. And I didn't listen to it for many, many, many years. And then when we first started talking about doing this project, I, I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to listen to Demolition again. But dude, like the last week in particular, I just kept coming back to it. I'm like, oh, I got to play it again. One thing... Metal Messiah is kind of okay. Yeah, it's, it's a good song. That's the last one. Um, overall, like the solos are very forgettable. Like up until every Priest record before this one, the solos were very like the, the two guys going off against each other. On this one here, it's like, KK's like, fuck it, I'm just going to do my own thing on one song. And then Glenn's like, fuck it, I'm doing the own, my own thing. And it just, it's not cohesive. It just doesn't sound like a Priest record. No. Um, but the songs grew on me, which is why I brought it up to a seven. But I started as a four. So maybe I'm more in between. Maybe I'm like five and a half. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's dreadful. I talked yeah. a lot about it. What do you think? It's inexcusably dreadful. Like, they had uh, ample time to figure it all out. 
One criticism I heard, I laughed when I read it, Tipton, they were like, why aren't you writing so many melodies on these these two albums, Jugulator? And he's like, we just, uh, we didn't feel melodic. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, thanks. It's like, um, but they had no excuse, like, because Halford in 2000 put out Resurrection. Yeah. He was ahead of the curve. Yeah, absolutely. And by that time, Bruce had returned. Yeah. And released Brave New but World. But they are releasing something like this. <laughs> I would have accepted Jugulator alone as a one-time blunder, but they did it twice. And in 2001, when Roy Z, they could have had Roy Z produce this. Like, that would have been amazing. There would have been nothing like this. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. I feel like they, they missed the big boat. There was a big boat, and they just missed it. True. And interesting you bring up Roy Z, because he had a close association with Bruce. And, and Halford. And, uh, well, no, they're not at first, right? So, like... Priest and Maiden, we didn't talk about this in the video, but Priest and Maiden kind of never really saw eye to eye, especially like KK. It goes back to like the early 80s. Maiden was opening for Priest and Paul Deano was shooting his mouth saying, we're going to blow Priest's balls off. Like we're going to blow them out of the water. And um, whether they did or didn't, I don't know. I wasn't there, but um, he was saying that in the media. And, and so Priest and Maiden kind of always didn't really see eye to eye. And then when... When Bruce came in after Paul, he continued the same kind of thing. But later on in years, Bruce and, and Rob became friends somehow because they collaborated on Halford's resurrection right. right, with the one you love to hate. And There's I, even discussion they were going to do three tremors with, yeah. with Bruce Dickinson, Jeff, Rob Halford, and Jeff Tate, Tate from, Queens from Queensryche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The three tremors instead of the three, three tenors. tenors. Yeah. But that never happened, but that would have been amazing. That really? would have been amazing or a disaster. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, at this time, Roy Z was more with Bruce and Rob, and so maybe that's why these Priest guys didn't talk to him. I don't know. Because Roy Z comes along on the next album. Is it Roy Zed? To Roy Z. I know. Roy Zed. <laughs> Canadian. We're Canadian. Roy Zed. <laughs> um, but anyways. Yeah. So anything else you want to mention about Demolition? Yeah. And oh, and before we take this one away, my favorite tracks on this was, I believe, Machine Man and Feed On Me. Feed On Me is a great song. Uh, yeah. Feed On Me is probably my favorite song on this album. Um, one thing I found going back through their entire discography is when you're playing them chronologically, this album doesn't sit well at all. Like it just, no. it's just an odd man out, especially for me because I like Jugulator. So you go from like Ram It Down to Painkiller to Jugulator. And then d what the fuck is like, why am I listening to Ramstein? Like, like seriously, like half the songs sound like Ramstein, which I, I like Ramstein, but... I want Judas Priest. I don't want Ramstein. If I want Ramstein, I'll listen to Ramstein. So it, it just sounds out of place. But when I mentioned I kept coming back to it, I would listen to like other stuff, but then I would play this and it was like, okay, it's not bad. When you take it out of the context of their discography, it, it wasn't bad, but it's just, it's, it failed as a Priest album. Yeah. And I was probably generous giving it a seven. It's, I'm probably more in the middle, like a five and a half, mm. but the recency effect, I'm giving it a seven. Okay. Yeah. So we go from 2001's Demolition with the worst ever album cover to 2005, Rippers Out, Rob's In with Angel, Angel of, Retribution. of Retribution. That's like a lot of syllables in an album title. <laughs> Angel of Retribution. And a very cool album cover. It's a cool album cover. The return of the old classic logo. What do you give this? I give this an 8.5. 7. Okay, so we're closer. Um, tell me, okay, why is it a 7? Okay. I still feel like on this album, they didn't, they got Roy Z. It sounds better. It's a it definitely step up. This is Halford's return to the band. This should be like Resurrection. Like, that's what it should be like. Yeah. Alfred's could come up with a resurrection in 2000. Yeah. It should be better than that. And it, it's not. And it should be like Brave New Worlds. It should maybe. be like Brave New Worlds. Yeah. But it's not. It's a bit grimy. Like, it's still a bit down toony, chug chuggy. A bit. A bit. Like, they didn't, like they didn't learn yet that people like, the, they like Painkiller. They like yeah. Scream for Vengeance. Yeah. It's like they don't, they don't know that. You know, it's still a good album. Like, it's way, way better than the last two. Easy. But I don't know. It, it's still good. I don't know. But Loch Ness, hello. Three points off right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Loch Ness is... I don't know what to think about that song. It's like... 
Did they write it during the demolition era? Or I don't know. It's it's weird. So it's okay. It's okay, but it, it hasn't aged well for me. <laughs> Probably, you, I didn't like it when it came out. Yeah, it was okay to me when it came out. I mean, obviously, okay. So for me, as I was a Rob Halford fanatic. In fact, before I ever saw Priest live, I saw Halford live. I saw him open for Maiden in 2000. So Halford was playing stuff off of Resurrection and then some Priest classics like Free Will Burning. And uh, what else? He played a... He played an unusual song that I can't think of right now, but he played Free Wheel Burning. That one sticks out in my head. But to me, that was, I never, I didn't know that Rob would ever go back to Priest. So to me, that was like seeing Priest for the first time. By the time 2005 comes along, I'm excited for Rob to rejoin the band. And I'm super pumped for this album. So I, I loved it from the beginning because it's Rob, he's back. Uh, right with Judas is Rising, Judas Rising, the first song, like his voice kind of fades in and it just kicks you in the face. Uh, Deal with the Devil is a great song. Hell Rider, worth fighting for. All real good song. Maybe Wheels of Fire is a bit weaker, um, along with Loch Ness. Those are probably two of the, two of the weaker songs. The first time I saw Priest live was uh, in 2005 in San Antonio, Texas, and they were playing this album. And it was a great show. Queensryche opened with Jeff Tate. And uh, just I was way up in the lawn, but it was still a great show. My first time seeing the full Judas Priest. So... This was your Rob, your Ian Hill, your Scott Travis on drums, your Glenn and your KK. Um, but yeah, like it's a great record. A lot of lyrical callbacks, like in Angel, the song Angel, and I think... Yeah, but I find they don't, they don't work. Like I find they're a bit corny. I, I like them. I like the callbacks because it's like Rob's back. He obviously So the last two albums, Glenn was writing most of the lyrics. Like, I don't know. He did callbacks when he was in Resurrection too. He did, yeah. And I like those ones. For some reason, I don't like them. As you didn't like these ones? Oh, no. I like them. But anyway, so they work for me, like Eulogy and on Angel. I think my favorite tracks are the two first ones, Judas is Rising and Deal with the Devil. Okay. Deal with the Devil is cool. Yeah. That would fit on like uh, any of the 80s albums. But the songwriting is is a bit better. Is oh, sorry, much better than the last two. I think the album length is interesting on this one. Let me check. 52. No, it was the last one. I didn't mention it, but Demolition is 70 minutes. Oh, that's a slog. Yeah. Which doesn't help, but I forgot to mention it. Yeah, so anyway, so, so, good return, average for me, okay, seven. And I could just, like, we haven't talked about our ratings with each other, like, we're revealing them now for the first time while we're talking, and I can already tell that, like, if this was a seven for you, you're probably not going to like the next couple, but we'll see when we get to those, because, like, some of these songs are, it's a formula that they repeat on later albums, Sometimes to better and worse effect, but um, yeah, for me, great return. Rob's back with the band. He kicks ass. The band kicks ass. Great guitars. It's good to have Rob back in the songwriting mix. Um, I think they're all the three are credited as the writers of the album, um, but it'd be curious to know like who contributed which songs the most. Hell Rider, I bet, is more of like a KK song, whereas like Deal with the Devil is probably more like Rob and, and Glenn and Judas is Rising. I would say, I would agree with you that it's not as great a return album as Brave New World was for Bruce. Um, and it's not as great as Resurrection, Halford's uh, solo album. All right, so that's Angel of Retribution, 2005. We're going to skip three years to Nostradamus. 102 minutes long. Which I give an 8 out of 10. A 5. Okay. It's too long. It is, it's overdone. It is too long. It's a burnt steak. <laughs> it's a burnt steak. Agree. It is too long. 102 minutes. Like this could have been. So, okay. Let's back up. Priest's first double album. They wanted to do twin turbos. They didn't. Now they're a big name. They've, they can push around the label and they're. Yeah, we're making a double album. We're making a, a, their first concept album about Nostradamus. Right, a guy nobody cares about, really. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so they wrote 100 minutes of music and they could have trimmed it down to 60. The, the melodies are kind of dull. The songs are long. There are hooks in the songs, but you have to listen. You have yeah. to sit through you gotta be these patient. super long, boring parts to get to the parts that kick that, are, that are good. They're still like we're still talking about amazing musicians that yeah. can write a good riff. 
but it's so hard to get there. The, the guitar synthesizers are back, but this time it's not like turbo or, or ram it down or anything. It's more of like um, a symphonic metal sound. Like they, they're going away from the traditional, like the painkillers and even Angel of Retribution. And they're going for a more symphonic sound. And um, so do you turn to this album a lot? Like you gave it a what? A seven? Eight. You gave it an eight? Yeah. That's pretty high. Does that mean you listen to this all the I, time? I do, but I skip songs. Um, like, like, like the last couple of songs are really good. There's a couple of songs I don't love. And there's parts that are just kind of meandering. Um, and they could, like if they trimmed it down to 60 minutes, it would probably go up to a nine. Yeah. 9.5. Um, but even with the fat, I still like it. I still th think it's great. There's actually a guy who was in the news. He listened to this album every day for like a year. Hmm. Every day. And he, like uh, a big Priest fan guy? Yeah, it was a newsworthy thing. But could I listen to it every day? No. There's some commendable parts to this album, like the ambition that was there. Um, <laughs> the drive to do something different that they hadn't done before. Mm -hmm. But Priest, you don't picture them as... They're not like a proggy metal band. That's... Yeah. That's not their character. This, this album is failed, I, I, I guess, in two ways. One is the, it's the wrong kind of music for them to write. And two, it's not good. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, I mean, I, that's okay. That's interesting. Yeah. It's, and I think you're not alone in your criticism. But also, I think Priest fans are divided on this one like they are with Turbo. Like people, yeah. who, the people who like it, like it. And the people who don't, really don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't think there's anyone putting Nostradamus as their favorite album of their catalog. This is a not a fan favorite. Yeah. People don't like this album. Yeah. Yeah, um, I've been reading everyone's opinion on the bands <laughs> like for the past few months okay. just to get an idea, sense of it, to see if I'm in line. Not not that I wanted to be in line. Like I like what I like, but I wanted to see what people thought. And most people hate this. <laughs> there's a couple of firsts on here that are kind of interesting. Like, yeah. it's the first time they use foreign lyrics. So there's a, yeah, a, French. They use French, Italian first, and then French later. Right. And the Italian, it's really cool. It's Rob singing it. The French part is it Rob just speaking? It's like a spoken word kind of thing. Because Nostradamus was French, exactly. which I thought was weird because in my notes I'm like, okay, so Maiden was singing in Spanish. In, in the 90s, and then they, in the 2000s, are singing in Italian. But why not French? No, Ceramis is French. Yeah. And then later on, there's the French part, and I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's weird, right? Like, is there an Italian connection with Nostradamus? I don't know. Like, why, the, why didn't they just do the Italian part in French as well? I don't know. But, um, so, I mean, those were first, first concept album. Uh, first concept album and first double album. I'll agree with you that it's a failed double album, and it's a failed concept album. I will agree. And maybe it's my... When it's an eight. My priest apology is probably... I'm saying it's an eight. Maybe it's more of a seven. You're a lot... Like, you can you can love an... You, yeah. It's all subjective. Exactly. It doesn't matter. I like it. I like I like to play it. Um, when I played it... Yeah, there was a couple parts. Like a, with the CD, you can easily skip. But when it's vinyl, you have to either, like, move the needle yeah. or just... Flip if the you over. like... If you like Nostradamus, power to you, go... Talk about it in the comments. Say how much you love Nostradamus. <laughs> because honestly, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with liking it. Actually, it's it's still a competent piece of music. It's just yeah, yeah. if I'm not if I compare this to Sad Wings of Destiny, it does not compute. <laughs> Very true. Or Scream for Vengeance does not compute. The great songs though are great. They are. Um, like uh, is it uh, Prophecy? What is it? Uh, Pestilence and Plague. Yeah, that one's good. Alone. Pestilence and Plague I like. Visions. And then the last song, Nostradamus. Like, and I like Revelations. I would be curious to know what you would think if we did, if you, like we cut it down to a 60 or even a 50 minute album, if you would like it more. Maybe you would. But yes, because as, less. Of, as it stands, you don't. Less of bad things <laughs> equals less yes, bad things. exactly. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Another notable uh, thing to mention is it's KK's last album with Judas Priest. Ah, yeah, right, um, right, right. He leaves, he leaves shortly after Why this. Why did he leave? Uh, I don't know. I've got his book and I have not done reading it, but um, I'm assuming, like I mentioned before, there was always tension between the guys. Maybe that reached a boiling point. I don't know. Okay. So um, out was uh, KK and then they brought in Richie Faulkner, who was much younger. Um, and he, so we'll talk about him in a bit. Um, but yeah, so... Uh, that's it, Nostradamus. Nostradamus, he's avenged. 
Richie Faulkner, the guitarist, the new guy, gets writing credit. On yeah. Redeemer of Souls, along yes. with uh, Glenn and Rob. Yes, and this was an improvement. And okay, well, what did you read it? Six. <laughs> so you went from four to six. Well, that was five. No, oh, five. Was five. five this to is six. like a six. I went to from eight to eight. It's an eight for me. Okay. Redeemer of so it's twenty fourteen. Redeemer of Souls, their seventeenth album, and the first with Richie. And they're still with Epic at this point. They had after demolition, they signed to Epic, and they're still on Epic, I think. Yeah. And yeah, Faulkner wrote some songs. Fa- Faulkner was much needed. New Blood, I yes, think. Yes, absolutely. I guess, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean. Maybe that's one reason why Nostradamus was less well-received. Maybe the guys were just getting tired and writing kind of the same old stuff. In comes Richie with new ideas. Richie's a fantastic guitarist. Uh, if you see his stuff, like, it's great. Seeing him live is great. He's a great performer. He's not KK, but he's still very competent. Um, I like what he brought to the band. Overall, I think Redeemer of Souls is a safe record for Judas Priest. Mm, yeah, um, yes. I think Nostradamus was not cr- safe. critically panned, like it wasn't well-received by most fans and most critics. So they needed to put something that was safe. And this is safe. It's just very pedestrian sounding priest songs. And um, I don't know, like for me, I like the album. There's a couple things I just don't like about it. Like there's not any, except for Battle Cry, which is an amazing song. No other songs oh, really, Battle Cry, yeah. no other songs really jump out at me as being all that great. No, I like Halls of Valhalla. Yeah, it's good. Halls, they're good. They're, I like Helen Back. Helen Back's good. Mid tempo, uh, nice, you know, heavy groove to it. Oh yeah, Helen Back's a great song. Okay. I think to Helen Back. Battle Cry and Helen Back are two of their those, stronger. Those songs. are good songs. Yeah. It, it's not a bad record. No, it's not bad. But I just there's something about it. It's Blah. the production or the in- inspiration. There's something missing. Same thing that happened to Maiden. Like the old, the older guys, they're writing slower songs. Yeah. And it works sometimes, or True. maybe they're just tired, or yeah. maybe they, they just need... I think Faulkner was a great idea. Uh, it's kind of like when you get a new player on a hockey team, he might not he might not um, play well the first season, but after a few seasons, they'll get their money's worth. Yeah, good point. And I think they, that ha- that will happen with Faulkner. Good, good analogy, actually. Yeah. And I'm not even a hockey fan, but... Yeah. <laughs> um, they actually recorded an additional five songs that were in the mix to be part of the same album. And they didn't, like, this This is a double CD. So they are on the second CD. Um, they released it separately on vinyl as something called Five Souls. The five tracks are amazing. <laughs> they, they should have put those five songs on this record and taken some of the other ones off. I think that would have driven up, at least for me, my reception of this album. But I have to take it as a whole, as just Redeemer of Souls, not the Five Souls extra songs that they did. Um, those five songs sound a lot more like classic priests, but also new. And I don't know, they were just great songs. And I think they would have fit better on this record. But they were also a sign of what was to come. Uh, the album cover is really cool too. It's, the album cover is good. It's cool. It's uh, even the the packaging. It's you, I don't know if you'll see it, but it's foil. I think we talked about this on the CD video that we did. Um, but it's it's a foil like if if you look yeah at the light, it's foiled it, it yeah I remember you saying that yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like what the fuck is foil and who produced it did you get that I don't remember uh, it's Mike Exeter oh, yeah. and Tipton so right they Tipton. had a, a, a guy I, I don't know Mike get, Exeter get Tipton out of the room like <laughs> <laughs> right he did enough damage then yeah. we can jump to the next yeah. one they get Tom Allen again but they get Andy Sneap Andy Sneap. Who is a master producer, and Absolutely. I don't know exactly how the, the the two of them work together, but they came up with this piece of piece of gold. They did piece of gold. So what did you give it? <laughs> well, I'm not giving. I don't give out tens and nines just just willy nilly. <laughs> so this is an eight, which is a solid like a this is like a rock solid eight. Okay. Like it was top fifteen of the year for me still. Yeah. Even though it's an eight, it's still in my top fifteen in twenty eighteen. Twenty eighteen? Right. Yeah, twenty eighteen. So you what is it? It's a ten. A perfect ten. Perfect album for me. My favorite since Painkiller. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, it's really, 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 really good. Yeah, the production you mentioned, Alum, and then Alum maybe on his own, maybe it wouldn't have been great, but Andy Sneap is fantastic as a producer. He's produced all kinds of great shit. Go out and check him out. He also uh, played for a British Nwabam band called Sabat, and then played in another band called Hell. Um, Hell uh, has, has a couple of really great records. Check those out. 
Uh, but most importantly, Sneep uh, plays guitar for Priest live right. yeah. because Glenn can't play anymore. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the last time I saw them, there was a bit of controversy. Before they started the tour, they weren't going to bring out Sneep. They were just going to play with Richie. One guitar. Oh, no. Judas Priest with one guitar. No. That's not going to work, guys. No. Anyways, there's a huge fucking backlash. Yeah. And, like, they they had to scramble and, like, okay, okay, we'll bring Andy. We'll bring Andy. One thing I really like on this album, actually, is um, I think... Uh, I hope I just don't get ripped to shreds for this. So I think Halford sounds amazing on it. And I think it's because they down tune the guitars just a bit. Maybe half of whatever. Yep. Um, so he sounds fresh because he has he's within it. He has Halford has embraced a new range where he's kind of in the middle now. He's mm-hmm. not doing the big shrieks, which, which he can still do. He can still do, but he's in a mi- more middle range, which sounds great. He sounds True. awesome. He sounds fresh. He can sing these songs. He sounds way younger than he should. You sound. He doesn't sound old. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Maiden has not given Bruce this benefit. True. They are playing all their songs exactly the same, and there's like, Bruce, you just better belt it out. <laughs> and I find he sounds a bit strained. Yeah. But Halford does not sound strained at all. That's a, re- that's a really good comment, actually. Very uh, great observation, um, for sure, RDO. Um, th- this album, his delivery is great. The band, uh, like Richie's probably more prominent in the songwriting. All three get credit for songwriting, but he's probably more prominent. The songs, compared to Redeemer of Souls, like the songs are more focused and condensed and they're just, yeah, uh, they don't waste time. They don't meander. They're just great, like great metal songs. It's songs that, again, summer music. I want to play this with yeah. the top down. Oh yeah, they're really good. Firepower and Lightning Strikes and Evil Never Dies, ABC. Those are yeah. amazing. All those three. No Surrender is a great song. It's about Glenn's battle. Yes, No uh, Surrender. Where I would have get why I gave an eight, and I got to pull out my notes. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no. Why I gave an eight and not like a nine or a ten is, oh, so light, okay, best tracks. Lightning Strikes, Rising from Ruin, Flamethrower. Rising from Ruin. The yes. Stun of the Flamethrower. Yeah. That song is amazing. It's awesome. Right. And you got Never the Heroes. So the, the tracks are, are great. But this album is still 58 minutes. I feel that is a bit long. I feel that's too long. Because most of their classic era albums are 36 to 45 minutes. Why does this have to be 58 minutes? Because they're all, they're all why bangers. Why is there an extra 13 minutes? I felt, when I first listened to this, I loved it. I loved it still, and I listen to it still, but I feel it's a bit long. I would, like, I would drop, I would I would drop Necromancer and Children of the Sun. Those two songs. Necromancer and Children of the Sun are boring songs. Probably the two weakest, yeah. I still wouldn't drop them. I like them. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you're right. They're weaker. If uh, those two songs weren't there, I think I would give this a 9. Maybe a 10. Okay. Everything else is on point. This Absolutely. album is on point. Yeah. A great record, especially 18th in their discography, like this late in their career. The album cover is amazing too. It calls back to the the, the, the Defenders of the Faith and Screaming for Vengeance covers with the color scheme and kind of the look and feel. Yeah, I just love the song Lightning Strike. Lightning Strikes. And, uh, it's like lightning striking twice, this album. It's like they <laughs> did Painkiller and then they did this. Because you'd think, oh, Pain- Painkiller is going to be the last album that's amazing. Well, they got one more. And maybe they have another one. Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope it lives up to firepower. It's going to be hard. It is. One of the things that Priest has done very well, and I haven't talked about it at all in this video, but I mentioned it in a previous video. But um, with some of the songs, they like to marry the, whatever, the, whatever Rob's singing about in the lyrics Sometimes they do like a musical effect to emphasize it. So as an example, in um, uh, in the in the Ripper back in the seventies, Rob sings this part where he goes, "I'll attack," and then you hear the guitars go dun, 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 with the drums hitting hard. So it sounds like you're being struck by something, right? So there's that. And then I mentioned in a previous video in Desert Plains when Rob sings "Wild Mountain Thunder," and then Dave Holland does this really cool like jazzy drum effect across from left to right, and then on this album. For the first time in many albums, they do it with lightning strikes. Lightning will strike. It sounds like a lightning strike with the guitar and the downbeat. Anyways, uh, pr- there's more examples of it, but those are the three I could think of. And it, it was very prominent on this one. That's the only reason I bring it up. Oh, cool. Interesting point. Yeah. So, I, By the way, I am so glad 
Grimby is here doing this review with me, I just got to say, because I don't have the in-depth, like, really to, to, to detail the, the solos, because I, I love solos, but I can't, I mean, I can, I remember the Maiden solos the best because I listened to it so much. True. I'm not that familiar with every song, every track for these albums, but. Yeah, I could, if I listen to a song, I could probably tell you that's, that's uh, KK and that's Glenn, but for the most part, probably not. Like, I can't. Tell them all. Anyway, I'm lucky to have Grimby here <laughs> backing me up. Yeah, well, I'm lucky to have you for the Maiden one. And if we ever do ACDC, I'll be complete. Well, ACDC, we just do the one, one album. It's the same. <laughs> I'd be out of my element. We'd, we'd just put the whole discography here and we just talk about one. <laughs> like, yeah. All right, so we're going to have to do our album rankings next right like where yes. do we rank them from one yes to where we rank them yes yeah here are the rankings so you gave saint class number one number two painkiller and then sad wings your first three i feel like my first three like i could have put saint class number one i could have i feel like putting sad wings i put sad wings my number one i feel like i'm a bit um i'm that's a bit about me not about the band sure because yeah. i like that album so much and i feel like I feel Stained Class merits number one easily, so I don't have any problem with you putting it there. Yeah, it's number one for me. Uh, I had a really, I have to say though, I had a really hard time ranking the albums, especially the ones that I really loved. Like, I had six that were a 10. So how do you pick one out of the six, right? Like, anywhere there was a tie, yeah. I had a real hard time. Yeah. Um, and this reflects my feelings today. Next year, it might change. Same with Maiden. I've I've gone back to our Maiden rankings and I've changed some of where I where the albums ended up. Um, but yeah, so you've got Sad Wings as first, Sin After Sin second. I have it sixth. Mm. You had Stained Class third. I feel those are, that's the Holy Trinity. Those three seventies albums. Yep. I just inserted Painkiller and Firepower into the mix. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I have an issue with that. Painkiller is awesome. I think I put Painkiller. I got Scream for Vengeance, then Painkiller. The mid albums, I don't know if they're similar. Mid in the middle, you we got British Steel, both of us. Yeah. I got Turbo way lower than you. For you some reason, you like Turbo more than Scream for Vengeance. I do, I know. <laughs> Which is ludicrous. That's my hot You're take. crazy. That's my hot take. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. <laughs> You're going to get burned, man. Oh, probably. And I've got Jugulator right after Screaming for Vengeance. Right, yeah, like Jugulator should be lower. Well, it's all depend. It all depends, but Turbo does not depend. Like that one is misplaced. No, nope. Turbo is awesome. Which one did I? I must have misplaced one. I don't know. Um, I got Point of Entry high. I, I really, Ooh. I weirdly like it. Yeah. Um, There's like Desert Plains to me is a is the diamond in the rough, <laughs> the rose growing up from the weeds. Yeah, you got it. Oh my. Uh, so yeah, like Point of Entry is your second last. Least favorite album. That's Absolutely. weird. Absolutely, and I have uh, you have Demolition over Jugulator, which is interesting. I I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I think that's it's common. a bit better. Is that common? Is do most people prefer? I don't know. I don't remember. Mm. But I thought the two are shit. They're, I gave them four. I just had to put one over the other. I gave Demolition a little edge because I think I like two songs on Demolition. I only like one song on <laughs> Jugulator. Yeah, um, yeah. So same, similar lists, some differences. <laughs> You want to see the rankings on Metal Archives? Yeah, okay, sure. So Metal Archives website, amazing. We're talking about ratings given by metalheads. Yep. It's an only metal website and they rank them on a scale of one to a hundred and then their number one would be Sad Wings. Okay. Then they give Stain Class and then Painkiller and then Scream for Vengeance okay, and then so, Sin After Sin. So those top four, five, those are similar. The top, I have the same top three, just different order. Oh, look, that point of entry, number is 17, just like you. And Demolition number 18, just like me. Huh. Yeah, weird. Yeah. Oh, and Jugulator's High. Jugulator, people like it for yeah. some reason. It's because it's a great album. Jugulator, people like that album. I, I discovered that when reading about a bit about it. I don't, but I think it's weird that... I don't know. I find that's weird. And Screaming is fourth, where I have it 10th. So that's a big... That's where I'm off. Well, yeah, people. that's like a fan favorite. It's and almost then, like their power stuff. And Turbo is 16, where I, I have it 9. Then we have the top. Any other comments? Mm, no. Just they're just fun to look at. Yeah. They got the top 500 metal albums of all time. These were the book by Martin Popoff, okay. and uh, this is um, voted by just people. Mm -hmm. I, I like just people. Not they're not critics, 
uh, and I, I actually voted. Uh, I gave my top 15. So, um, Scream for Vengeance fell at number 12, best metal album of all time in this book. Wow, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, I know it is. Popoff's reaction to it is really funny. It's like, uh-huh, number 12, right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Because it's, it's not even the best Priest record. I know, it's so funny. Yeah. British Steel, uh, number 21. That's also a weird placing for British Steel. I've, he says, I've well and far and long voiced my disappointment with the filed down edges of this album versus what came ripping off the hinges before it. <laughs> so yeah, British Steel, then Painkiller 26, which is, you know, one thing I thought was interesting, Sazzy Wings 34, it should, it should have been higher, but I don't think people care. 42, Unleashed, Unleashed in, in the East. East. Oh, it's a great live record. And you mentioned some of the live records are really good. I have to check it out. I didn't mention Unleashed in the East, but it is a great live record. People, Priest was accused of some studio trickery with it. But it worked. Um, one thing that jumps out about Unleashed in the East is genocide and tyrant are played faster and they sound even heavier. Oh, I have to check it out. Oh yeah, it's so good. Well, I think I've heard it, but anyway. <laughs> Pop-Off says, why this album works so well is that it encapsulated the thrilling life force of the band before they pooched the crustless wonder loaf that was British Steel. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, Martin. Actually, there's two live albums that uh, rank number 408. You got Priest Live. That's the one I mentioned earlier. And hilariously, Jugulator is 322. Hey, in this book. love for Jug. 322. Yeah. What the hell? <laughs> like it shouldn't exist, dude. It's such a great record. Should have been aborted. You're missing out. Glenn Tipton had said about um, Jugulator, it's fast and aggressive, and it's better than Painkiller. Oh, Glenn, no, no. He said that probably went while promoting the album. Yeah, yeah exactly. Ripper Owens did contribute to this book. Oh, did he? His, his um, albums that he contributed for Greatest of All Time, if you're curious, are Judas Priest, Screaming for Vengeance, Iron Maiden, Number of the Beast, Black Sabbath, Heaven and Hell, Dio, Holy Diver, Soundgarden, Bad Motor That Fire. is a good Soundgarden album. Yeah. Oh my God, Demolition. Well, he's on it. What? He voted for his own? Okay. Is this real? Anyway. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, that's Sabotage, weird. Sabotage, Anthrax. Not even Anthrax's best album. Among oh, the Among the Living? Yeah. No. Pers Whoa. Persistence of Time. Oh, okay. Another <laughs> video. Another video. All right. That was uh, as epic as that discography. Who Any final thoughts? I mean, no. I mean, Priest is my favorite band. You, uh, viewers, you probably saw the passion coming out of me. Um, I... Probably an apologist, sure, um, but I'm unapologetic about my love for the band, and I just I love them. I love seeing them live. I love listening to, to their music, and uh, they're timeless to me. Um, my wife and I made a Spotify playlist of the best '70s and '80s songs. And of Priest or of anything? Of anything, and it, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff on there, not just metal. Like I've got, you know, George Michael, and like I've got some out there kind of songs, but. Um, as I was going through his priest songs, it, I had a real hard time not including them. Like the, my wife kind of criticized me, like, "Oh, you got too much priest on there." So I tried to cut some of them back. Does she? Does she like priest? She does. Yeah, but there's just there's so many iconic, great songs that are '70s and '80s that had to be on the playlist. Like I love the band, and um, I always will. And you know, I'm glad Rob's back. I'm sad that Glenn can't play anymore. I was sad that he wasn't. He he, he didn't even come yeah. on stage when I saw them. That's sad. It's was but, he there? He was touring with them and he, he came out for one song, I forget which song, like occasionally on some of the tour stops, but most of the time he, he couldn't. So it's, it's sad. They aren't what they used to be. I think, honestly, they should call it a day. Call it a day. No. No. Rob's 70. He can still belt it out. They got Faulkner. But, no, but, no, 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 no. But I know I they're working agree. on one more agree. album. I don't agree. So give me what, but KK's not there either, right? So it's really just Ian, Rob, Scott. And oh. and Richie, but then you got KK who went off and did KK's Priest with Ripper Owens, and I loved the album. I know it wasn't critically well received, but it's a great album to me. Oh. Um, there's a set the sequel to the Sentinel on that record. Yeah, I heard it. And I thought it was. I didn't like KK's Priest. It's not as good as the Sentinel, but it's still a good song. It, it's it's a, like Return to Hangar 18 when. Yeah. It doesn't feel right when bands do that. I do know. something new. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I love. 
just to re reply, like I love priests in a very different way. Like I re regard them extremely highly in the role and responsibility of the crystallization of the genre of heavy metal. I will put them next to Iron Maiden uh, or under or over, it depends on what we're talking about. Um, I feel like they are the OG, you know what I mean? Yeah. And if you put Black Sabbath aside, I think they are the OG. Like I think, yep. like and Black Sabbath, I feel like they were high and they did something really wicked. And then Judas Priest, I feel it was like deliberate. Yeah, it, that's exactly the difference. Like Black Sabbath never wanted to be metal. They never said they were metal, but Priest did. They took it by the horns and they fucking ran with it. Yeah, and so I feel like they are probably the most metal, if arguably the most metal band alive. And, like their catalog that we just talked about is so varied and diverse. Like I mentioned in the previous video that about Maiden that Maiden to me is the quintessential metal band because they are like start to finish it's all metal. There's no there's not a rock and roll in their discography, you know what I mean? And there's not a demolition in their discography. Like they're not they Maiden just is, exudes metal from their image to their sound to their live performance like they're the quintessential metal band, but Without Priest's influence, like, I don't know if they would be who they are. Yeah, well, without Priest, I'm not sure. I'm not really sure what the state of 80s thrash metal would have been without Priest. Yeah, it, right, exactly. Like, Exciter and Sinner, like, those all had a part to play. And a lot of bands cite Judas Priest as an influence in this. I mean, I think metal still would have come about, but maybe it would have come about differently. Without. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, hey, it's been a long video. If you're watching this far, thanks for watching. It was fun. We had a good time, yeah, I hope. It was awesome. Yeah, I, I mean, we don't do these as often, but I do enjoy our time together doing yeah. them. So thanks, RDO. <laughs> Thank and, you, uh, Grimby. And stay metal. Cheers. Turbo, 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 turbo. So turbo, turbo, turbos, turbos. Yeah, yeah. yeah.